Hey, welcome. Duvid here. i um, been looking forward to doing this stream for a long time. Um, been talking about this multiple truth hypothesis for over a year now. Um, been a few streams, Claire Cause channel, Jennifer's channel. I've been mentioning it uh, more and more. And uh, you know, so here I am, and uh, we're finally going to uh, have a stream about the, about the multiple truth hypothesis. So uh, there's multiple angles to the multiple truth hypothesis, and uh, it's largely a, like a heuristic tool that I use to frame answering the hard problem of consciousness, you know, how thought arises, and also, you know, contradictions in my own life. You know, if Claire's here in the chat, you like, I was okay, like, I'm Hindu, I'm Hasidic, I'm all these things, I'm a half Jew. Um, so there's kind of like these multiple truths, uh, concepts where like, okay, like, am I this or am I that or am I both? And is it possible at you know, one period of time I'm this and a different period of time I'm that, uh, but yet both are true? To uh, a larger approach to, of uh, uh, pure epistemology for how to understand the material world. Um, so I've gathered together quite a bit of uh, scholarship, some evidence. Um, George Floyd Respector, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, I'll try to uh, check the chat every once in a while. It's going to be largely me reading from uh, various uh, precursor knowledge, uh, and then I'll try to frame this uh, generic structural knowledge into the direction of the multiple truth hypothesis. I'm going to enter um, screen share. So make sure my sound is working. And uh, sorry if I'm talking a little slow. I'm going to be doing a lot of reading. And uh, there's going to be a lot of these streams. So, you know, this is somewhat an exercise for myself to drill these concepts into my head and also to present some basic uh, precursor knowledge that people should know. So I had kind of, uh, you know, talking with Jennifer on... Uh, week in review and in, in trying to frame the multiple truth hypothesis in a more scientific way. And I tried to write in a mathematical language here where you'd have like the integral of the set. And I, I left the set open that is a subset of an infinite set times the probability of, uh, I just called you. Um, and you know, I'll have to explain what that is and probably uh, this is gonna change, but just the simplest understanding equals one. It was the concept if there's a set of all possibilities, and then there's a subset that just uses a few of those possibilities, and you summed up, you know, took the integral of all of those times the probability that that subset of axioms actually correctly defines the material reality that um, equals one. And so it actually will have theological implications and other things. So I'm, I'm going to work on it in terms of, uh, uh, you know, like a scientific theory that will have mathematical notation and possibly even like, you know, integrals and uh, derivatives. So uh, ultra T, thanks for showing up. So let me remind people if they haven't uh, seen this before, I'll put this in the chat. Um, I did a whole bunch of streams a few years ago. These are already from... Uh, 2018, almost two years ago, when I had my first you know, major debate with uh, Jean-Francois Greppi on evolution. I think he actually had to take that stream down. Maybe it's on BitChute. And I did a uh, post-stream um, you know, response to JF in kind of like a science and proof of the soul, because the, when I was arguing against uh, JF on the public space, it was largely just about evolution, and I was taking the negative, he was taking the positive, and I wasn't giving an alternative belief to um, evolution. So I went through kind of like the history of epistemology and ideas and science and uh, thinkers of the Greeks and more from a scientific perspective, not like a Judaic Kabbalistic, but more the Western canon um, of the Greeks through uh, the enlightenment and, you know, through like Popper and Kuhn and uh, to try to show what science actually tells. I went through the famous arguments, you know, anyone who watched it was Week in Review, uh, me and Jennifer and Claire and other people have talked about uh, this at length, um, you know, the various, like the theological argument, the cosmological argument, um, you Leibniz, uh, 
theory of uh, monads, interesting things, and I'm, I'm going to briefly touch upon it. But uh, um, and, and I'm not sure how how quality these uh, these are. You know, I just did my best. Some of it was for my own uh, purposes. Um, but you could see there's 27 streams in this uh, uh, public study sessions. Many of them are for hours. I got the you know the second stream here is a uh, Kuhn, Popper, epistemology, empiricism, and knowledge. And I go into like the logical positivism and uh, the history of science and uh, various important things like Kuhn and Popper that, uh, you know, people who uh, want to understand uh, science and the nature of knowledge on a deeper level um, should know that I did a stream about uh, speed reading and uh, really an explanatory stream at the beginning for just how to speed read. And I found some good PowerPoints to say over the rules of speed reading. And I looked at some critical literature on the science of, of uh, you know, people who critique it or, or ex explanation for how it works. And the reality is you have to answer the hard problem of consciousness to really know how speed reading works. But there are some skeptics that claim it doesn't work. And I cover some of that literature, um, but uh, also just the basic technique for a person who wants to learn how to speed read. And then from there, I went more into... Uh, the best current state of knowledge on consciousness, um, what we understand about the brain, and I tried to show where the soul would fit into that. So, you know, the, the framing of the multiple truth hypothesis is going to be like a grand unification uh, framework. I'm not saying I'm answering all the universe uh, question. I just created a framework uh, to do it. So there's a whole bunch of these, and I went on other topics and just other things to uh, even like universal basic income and usury, Autonomous, autonomous vehicles, and then I started with uh, coronavirus with Church of Entropy. So uh, in that light, uh, let's get started. So thank God I got uh, 10 people here. Um, and uh, so let's look at some precursors, and I'm, I'm just going to read some basic stuff. So for a lot of people, you know, this is kind of like a, a brush up in uh, Western philosophy, and uh, the reason I'm doing this is to uh, show the framework for within the multiple truth hypothesis is going to it's going to fall. And actually, we're going to see this article coming up from Thomas Chamberlain, a geologist, was president of the University of Wisconsin, and uh, went on to found the Journal of Geology, which he edited till his death. And he wrote an article called "The Method of Multiple Working Hypotheses." So uh, we're going to look at that article from 1890. Um, but uh, I don't think anyone uses the expression besides Duvid multiple truth hypothesis. So like I haven't patented it. Um, this Chamberlain, our ge geologist, and the method of multiple working hypothesis is the closest I've came to um, this. So let's read a little bit from the basics of philosophy. And we're going to look at... Uh, empiricism and rationalism as so I have these long streams on these or people might be knowledgeable but just so I have the correct words on the tip of my tongue and people understand um, the general philosophical background that uh, where, where this fits in so empiricism is the theory that the origin of all knowledge is sense experience it emphasizes the role of experience and evidence especially sensory perception in the formation of ideas and argues that only knowledge humans can have is a, a posteriori based on experience. Most empirists also discount the notion of innate ideas or innatism, the idea that a mind is born with the ideas or knowledge and is not a blank slate, slate at birth. In order to build a more complex body of knowledge from the these direct observations, induction and inductive reasoning, making generalizations based on individual instances must be used. This kind of knowledge is therefore known as indirect empirical knowledge. Empiricism is contrasted with rationalism, the theory that the mind may apprehend some truths directly without requiring the medium of the senses. The term empiricism has a dual etymology stemming both from the Greek word for experience and from the more uh, specific classical Greek and Roman usage of empiric, referring to the physician whose skill derives from practical experience as opposed to instruction in theory. 
The term empirical rather than empiricism also refers to the method of observation and experiment used in natural and social sciences. It is a fundamental requirement of the scientific method that all hypotheses and theories must be tested against observations of the natural world rather than resting solely on a priori reasoning, intuitions, or revelation. Hence, science is considered to be a methodological empirical in nature. Brief history of empiricism, uh, concept of the tabula rasa, 11th century, uh, um, Avicenna, um, from the golden age of Islam, further argued that knowledge is attained through empirical familiarity with objects in the world from which one abstracts universal concepts, which can then be further developed through a syllogistic method of reasoning. Uh, 12th century Arabic philosopher uh, Abu Bakr, demonstrated the theory of tabula rasa as a thought experiment in which the mind of a feral child develops from a clean slate to that of an adult in complete isolation from society or a desert island through experience alone. And on a good few hundred years later, um, you could see on my channel or just a regular scholarship uh, fill in some of this missing history, but for the importance of the history of empiricism, next to Sir Francis Bacon, can be considered an early empiricist through his popularization of inducted methodology for scientific inquiry, which was since become known as the scientific method. In the 17th and 18th century, the members of the British Empiricism School, John Locke, George Berkeley, and David Hume, were primary exponents of his empiricism. They vigorously defended empiricism against the rationalism of Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza. The doctrine of empiricism was first explicitly formulated by the British philosopher John Locke in his 17th uh, century. Locke argued in his essay concerning human understanding of, 19, of 1690 that the mind is the top of the rasa on which experience leaves their marks and therefore denied that humans have innate ideas or that anything is knowable without reference to experience. However, he also held that some knowledge um, could be arrived at through intuition and reasoning alone. Irish philosopher George, uh, Bishop George Berkeley considered that Locke's view opened a door that could lead to eventual atheism put forth in his treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge of 1710, a different, very extreme form of empiricism, which things only exist either as a result of their being perceived or by virtue, virtue of the fact that they are are an entity doing the perceiving. He argued that the continued existence of things results from the perception of God, regardless of whether there are humans around or not. Any In any order humans may see in nature is effectively just the handwriting of God. Berkeley's approach to empiricism would later uh, come to be called subjective idealism. Scottish philosopher David Hume brought the empiricist viewpoint to an extreme skepticism. He argued that all human knowledge can be divided into two categories, relations of ideas, propositions involving some contingent observation of the world, such as the sun rises in the east, and matters of fact, um, like mathematical, logical propositions, and that ideas are derived from our impressions or sensation. In the face of this, he argued that even the most basic beliefs about the natural world, or even in the existence of the self, cannot be conclusively established by reason uh, but we must accept them anyway because of their basis in instinct and custom. John Stuart Mill, mid-19th century, took Hume and Berkeley so reasoning a step further in maintaining that inductive reasoning is necessary for all meaningful knowledge, including mathematics, and that matter is merely the permanent possibility of sensation. As he put it, this is an extreme form of empiricism known as phenomenalism, the view that physical objects, property, and events are completely reducible to mental objects, properties, and events. So in the late 19th and early 20th century, several forms of pragmatism arose, which attempted to integrate the apparently mutually exclusive insights of empiricism and rationalism, uh, Pierce and James, you know, radical empiricism. Um, next step, the development of empiricism was logical empiricism or logical positivism, an early 20th century attempt to synthesize the essential ideas of British empiricism, which is a strong emphasis on sensory experience as the basis for knowledge, with certain insights from mathematical logic that had been developed by uh, Frege, Russell, and Wittgenstein. This resulted in a kind of extreme empiricism, which held that any genuinely synthetic assertion must be reducible to an ultimate assertion or a set of ultimate assertions which express direct observations or perceptions, which basically takes us up to the present moment. Okay, so let me read this on rationalism and uh, appreciate people, you know, tuning in. And if you know they enjoy this educational experience of learning along with me, um, I'm going to show 
just a, a little basic of the precursors of Western philosophy to leading up to this multiple truth hypothesis. So we'll also look at rationalism. Is the view appealing to intellectual and deductive reasoning as opposed to sensory experience as or any religious teachings as the source of knowledge or justification? Thus it holds that some propositions are knowable by us by intuition alone, while others are knowable by deduced by being deduced through valid arguments from intuited pro propositions. Depending on the strength of the belief, this can result in a range of positions from the moderate view that reason has precedence over other ways of acquiring knowledge, the radical position that reason is the only path to knowledge. Rationalism relies on the idea that reality has a rational structure and that all aspects of it can be grasped through mathematical and logical principles and not simply through sensory experience rather than being a tabula rasa to be imprinted. With sense data, the mind is structured by and responds to <coughs> mathematical methods of reasoning. Rationalists adopt at least one of three main claims, intuition, deduction. Some proposition, propositions are knowable by us by intuition alone, while others are knowable by being deduced from intuitive propositions. Some rationalists take intuitive intuition to be infallible, claiming that whatever we intuit must be true. Others allow for the possibility of false intuitive propositions. Some claim that only mathematics can be knowable by intuition and deduction. Some that ethical truths can also be intuited. Some more radical rationalists maintain the whole range of metaphysical claims, like the existence of God, free will, and the duality of mind and body, are included within the range of intuition and deduction. Innate knowledge. We have knowledge of some truths as part of our innate, rational innate, uh, nature. Experience may trigger a process by which we bring this knowledge to consciousness, but the experiences do not provide us with the knowledge itself, which has in some way been with us all along. Some rationalists claim that we gained this innate knowledge in an earlier existence, some that God provides us with it at creation, and others that it is part of our nature through natural selection. Innate concepts, some of the concepts as opposed to actual knowledge we employ are part of innate rational nature. Some would argue, however, that innate concepts are entailed by innate knowledge because a particular instance of knowledge can only be innate if the concepts that are contained in the proposition are also innate. Some rationalists also claim, in addition to the claims above, that knowledge we gain by intuition and deduction, as well as the ideas and instances of knowledge that are innate to us, are indispensable and could not have been gained through sense experience and or the reason is superior to experience as a source of knowledge. Rationalism, rationalism is contrasted with empiricism, the view that the origin of all knowledge is sense experience and sensory perception. It is usually associated with the introduction of mathematical methods into philosophy during the age of reason and enlightenment by the major rationalist figures, Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza. It is commonly referred to as continental rationalism because it was predominant in the continental schools of Europe where British empiricism dominated in Britain. The distinction between rationalism and empiricism, however, is perhaps not as clear cut as it's sometimes suggested. It would probably not have been recognized by the enlightenment philosophers involved for example, the three main rationalists were all committed to the importance of empirical science, as in many respects the empiricists were closer to Descartes in their methods and metaphysical theories than were Leibniz and Spinoza. Both Leibniz and Spinoza asserted that, in principle, all knowledge, including scientific knowledge, could be gained through the use of reason alone. Though they both observed that this was not possible in practice for human beings except in specific areas such as mathematics. So the roots of rationalism go back to uh, Pythagoreanism and, and the Greeks. Rene Descartes, the earliest best-known proponent of rationalism, he believed that knowledge of eternal truth, mathematics, and the epistemological and metaphysical foundations of the science could be attained by reason alone without the need for any sensory experience. Other knowledge of the knowledge of physics required experience of the world aided by the scientific method, a moderate rationalist position. For instance, his famous dictum, Cognitive ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, is a conclusion reached by a priori and not through an inference from experience. Descartes held that some ideas, innate ideas, come from God, other ideas are derived from sensory experience, and still others are fictitious or created by the imagination. Of these, the only ideas which are certainly valid according to Descartes are those which are innate. Brooks Spinoza expanded upon Descartes' basic principles of rationalism, his philosophy centered on several principles most of which relied on his notion that God is the only absolute substance, similar to Descartes' conception of God 
and that substance is composed of two attributes, thoughts and extension. He believed that all aspects of the natural world, including man, were modes of the eternal substance of God and therefore only be known through pure thought or reason. Gottfried Leibniz attempted to rectify what he saw as some of the problems that were not settled by Descartes by combining Descartes' work with Aristotle's no notion of form and his own conception of the universe as composed of monads. He believed that ideas exist in the intellect innately, but only in a virtual sense, and it is only when the mind reflects on itself that those ideas are actualized. Immanuel Kant started traditional rationalists having studied Leibniz and Christian Wolff, but after the studying the empiricist David Hume's work, he developed a distinctive and very influential rationalism of his own, which attempted to synthesize the traditional rationalist and empiricist traditions. Okay, so thanks for bearing with me for uh, 15 minutes there to uh, give this little precursor backup uh, information about uh, you know, the history of Western philosophy related to empiricism and rationalism that I'm going to be building off. Let me take a, my, a drink, a kombucha, say my blessing. Okay, so it's important to uh, get these precursor backgrounds of the science of philosophy, which is, as I said, I covered for tens of hours in these public study sessions that, uh, you know, people who want to use my resources are free and encouraged to do. Please enjoy. Comment in the videos. <coughs> and, uh, you know, so these basic questions like what is truth? How do we know what is reality? How do we know anything about the material world? How do we know anything about ourselves? And the various methods that we go about to try to understand what is going on. So uh, there's a whole corpus of... Uh, all types of traditions on the matter, Kabbalah and Hinduism and Vedic literature. And uh, the background is science centers mostly on the West, although not exclusively. And uh, so I wanted to give a precursor of the multiple truth hypothesis in terms of the Western canon. Um, but it's really designed to be a framework for much more than that. But, uh, you know, hopefully going through just this uh, precursor of the science, the philosophy of science, you know, that is very unclear how we actually go about getting at truth. What is truth? What are valid methods for truth? Uh, what is actually the true nature of the material realm? So, you know, don't think that science has been uh, conclusive on that. And there's a lot more research uh, that needs to go into that. So, you know, with that background, let's uh, jump straight into um, this first similar use of uh, multiple working hypothesis, similar to the multiple truth hypothesis. So uh, this uh, geologist, uh, Professor Chamberlain, I, I'll try to read a good majority of this paper. I think people will get a feel for um, what Duvid is trying to say in the multiple truth hypothesis, looking back at this geologist who's kind of struggling with the same thing that Duvid's struggling right now uh, with, and comes up with this you know, multi method of multiple working hypothesis. With this method, the dangers of uh, parental affection, um, so this is uh, T.C. Chamberlain, 1890, uh, geologist, uh, founder of the Journal of Geology um, from Wisconsin, the method of multiple working hypothesis. With this method, the dangers of, of parental affection for a favorite theory can be circumvented. As methods of study constitute the leading theme of our session, I've chosen as a subject in measurable constants the method of working, multiple working hypothesis in its application to investigation, instruction, and citizenship. There are two fundamental classes of study. The one consists in attempting to follow by close imitation the process of previous thinkers or to acquire by memorization the results of their investigations. It is merely secondary, imitative, or uh, act Inquisitive study. The other class is primary or creative study. It is the effort to think independently or at least individually in the endeavor to discover new truth or to make new combinations of truth or at least to develop an individualized aggregation of truth. The endeavor is to think for oneself whether the thinking lies wholly in the fields of previous thoughts or not. It is not necessary to this habit of study that the subject material should be new, 
but the process of thought and its results must be individual and independent, not the mere following of previous lines of thought ending in predetermined results. The demonstration of the problem in Euclid precisely, precisely as laid down uh, is an illustration of the former, the demonstration of the same proposition by a method of one's own, or a matter distinctively individual is an illustration of the latter, both lying entirely within the realm of the known and the old. Creative study, however, finds its largest application in the subjects in which, while much is known, much more remains to be known. Such fields which we as naturalists cultivate and we are gathered for the purpose of developing improved methods lie lying largely in the creative phase of study, though not wholly so. Intellectual methods have taken three phases in the history of progress thus far. What may be the evolutions of the future, it may not be prudent to forecast. Naturally, the methods we now urge seem the highest attain attainable. These three methods may be designed. First, the method of ruling theory. Second, the method of a working hypothesis. And third, the method of multiple working hypothesis. In the early days of intellectual development, the sphere of knowledge was limited and was more nearly within the compass of a single individual, and those who assumed to be wise men or aspired to be thought so felt the need of knowing, or at least seemingly to know, all that was known as a justification of their claims. So also there grew up an expectancy on the part of the multitude that the, of the wise that the learned would explain whatever new thing presented itself, thus prize and ambition on the one hand, and expectancy on the other developed a putative wise man whose knowledge boxed the compass and whose acumen found an explanation for every new puzzle which presented itself. The disposition has propagated itself and has come down to our time as an intellectual uh, predilection through the compassing of an entire horizon of knowledge has long since been abandoned affectionate. Aff affectation. As in the earlier days, so still is the habit of some of the hastily conjure up an explanation for every new phenomenon that presents itself. Interpretation rushes to the forefront of the chief obligation pressing upon the putative wise men. Laudable as the efforts at explanation is in itself, it is to be condemned when it runs before a serious inquiry into the phenomenon itself, a dominant disposition to find out what is, should proceed and crowd aside the question commendable at a later stage, how came this so? First full facts, then interpretations. Premature theories. The habit of precipitate explanation leads rapidly to the development of tentative theories. The explanation offered for a given phenomenon is naturally under the impulse of self-consistency offered for like phenomenon as they present themselves. And there is soon developed a general theory explanatory of a large class of phenomenon similar to the original one. This general theory may not be supported by any further consideration than those which were involved in the first hasty inspection. For a time, it is likely to be held in a tentative way with a measure of candor. With this tentative spirit and measurable candor, the mind satisfies its moral sense and deceives itself with the thought that the proceeding cautiously and impartially towards the goal of ultimate truth, it fails to recognize that no amount of provisional holding of a theory so long as the view is limited and in the investigation partial justifies an ultimate conviction. It is not the slowness with which conclusions are arrived that should give satisfaction to the moral sense, but the thoroughness, the completeness, the all-sidedness, the impartiality of the investigation. It is the tentative stage that the affections entered with their uh, blinding influence. Love was long since represented as blind, and what is true in the personal realm of measurability, true in the intellectual realm, important as the per intellectual affections are as stimuli and as rewards, they are nevertheless dangerous uh, factors which uh, menace through the integrity of the intellectual processes. The moment one has offered an original explanation for a phenomenon which seems satisfactory, that moment affection for his intellectual child springs into existence, and as the explanation grows into a definite theory, his parental affections cluster around his intellectual offspring, and it grows more and more dear to him so that while he holds it seemingly tentative, he still lovingly, it is still lovingly tentative and not impartially tentative. So soon as the parental affection takes possession of the mind, there is a rapid passage to the adoption of the theory. This is the unconscious selection and magnifying of the phenomenon that falls into harmony with the theory and support it, and an unconscious neglect of those that fail 
of uh, coincidence. The mind lingers with pleasure upon the facts that fall happily into the embrace of the theory and feels a natural coldness towards those that seem refractory. Instinctive, there is a special searching out phenomenon that support it. For the mind is led by its desires. There springs up also an unconscious pressing of the theory to make it fit the facts to make them fit the theory. When these biasing tendencies set in, the mind rapidly degenerates into a partiality of paternalism. The search for facts, the observation of phenomenon, and their interpretation are all dominated by affection for the favorite theory until it appears to the author or its advocate to have been overwhelmingly established. The theory then rapidly rises to the ruling position and investigation, observation, interpretation are controlled and directed by it from an unduly favored child that readily becomes master and leads its author wherever it will. The subsequent history of that mind in respect to the theme is but the progressive dominance of a ruling idea. Briefly summed up the evolution as this, a premature explanation passes into a tentative theory, then is adopted uh, as a theory and then into a ruling theory when the last stage has been reached. Unless the theory happens per chance to be a true one, all hope of the best results is gone. To be sure the truth may be brought forth by an investigator dominated by a false ruling idea, these very errors may indeed stimulate investigation on the part of others. But the condition is an all unfortunate one. Dust and chaff are mingled with the grain in what should be a winnowing process. So uh, for anyone uh, familiar with my ideas on cognitive dissonance, we'll recognize this theory of uh, science and the formation of scientific ideas is uh, very similar to the theory of cognitive dissonance. And this paper is from 1890. And, you know, the language is uh, a little difficult to read, but uh, hopefully uh, you'll gain something from actually reading uh, this article. Ruling theories linger. As previously implied, the method of the ruling theory occupied a chief place during the infancy of investigation. It is an expression of the natural infantile tendencies of the mind. Though in case applied to its higher activities, for in the earlier stage of development, the feelings are relatively greater than in the later stages. Unfortunately, it did not wholly pass away with the infancy of investigation, but has lingered along in individual instances to the present day and finds illustration in universally learned men and pseudoscientists of our time. The defects of this method are obvious and its error is great. If I were to name the central psychological fault, I would say that it was the admission of intellectual affection to the place that should be dominated by impartial intellectual rectitude. So long as intellectual interest dealt chiefly with the intangible, so long as it was possible for the habit of thought to survive and to maintain its dominance because the phenomenon themselves being largely subjective were plastic in the hands of the ruling idea, but so soon in, as investigation turned itself earnestly to inquire into natural phenomenon, whose manifestations are tangible, whose properties are rigid, whose laws are rigorous, the defects of the method became manifest. And an effort at the Reformation ensued. The first great endeavor was rep uh, repressive. The advocates of reform insisted that theorizing should be restrained and efforts directed to the simple determinations of fact. The effort was to make scientific study fact instead of casual, because theorizing in narrow lines has led to manifest evils. Theorizing, theorizing was to be condemned. The Reformation urged was not the proper control and utilization of theoretical effort, but its suppression. We did not need to go backward more than 20 years to find ourselves in the midst of attempted Reformation. Its weakness lay in the narrowness and its restrictiveness. There is no nobler aspiration of the human intellect than desire to compass the cause of things. The disposition to find explanations and to develop theories is laudable in itself. It is only its ill use that is reprehensible. The vitality of study quickly disappears when the object sought is a mere collocation of dead on meaning facts. The, the inefficiency of the simple repressive reformation becomes apparent. Improvement was sought in the method of the working hypothesis. This is affirmed by the scientific method of the day, but to this I take exception. The working hypothesis differs from the ruling theory in that it is used as a means of determining facts. And as for its chief function, the suggestion of lines of inquiry, the inquiry being made not for the sake of facts under the method of the ruling theory, the stimulus was directed to the finding of facts for the support of the theory. Under the working hypothesis, the facts are sought for the purpose of ultimate induction and demonstration, the hypothesis being but the means for a ready development of facts and their 
relations and the arrangement and preservations of material for the final induction. It will be observed that the distinction is not a sharp one and that a working hypothesis may be the utmost ease to generate into a ruling theory. Affection may easily cling about an hypothesis as about a theory and the demonstration of the one may become a ruling passion as much as the others. So you see this paper written in 1890 um, really uh, is the basis of the multiple truth hypothesis. And you see all these critiques that Chamberlain is giving uh, in 1890 uh, are really applicable till uh, you know today, just as applicable today. Um, okay, and Jesus Potter, thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope people enjoy this content and are learning from it, but uh, I, I would do this just for myself and just to improve my knowledge to read this information and watch it back so I could uh, better forward it. And for people who want to know more about the thought process of Duvid in the formulation stage of the multiple truth hypothesis, I'm publicly putting it out there for anybody to join um, you know, the cooperation and work together with me. Um, but yeah, I would understand that a lot of people aren't going to find this too interesting to watch uh, live or for hours, but you can come back later during, uh, you know, parts that may be more or less interesting or watch it later in, you know, two speed or, or a quicker speed uh, when I've time stamped it. So you could stick around, stick around uh, you know, or just watch the parts that are pertinent to your interest. Okay, so family of hypothesis. Conscientiously followed, the method of working hypothesis is marked improvement upon the method of the ruling theory, but it has defects. Defects which are perhaps best expressed by the ease with which the hypothesis becomes a controlling idea. To guard against this, the method of multiple working hypothesis is urged. It differs from the former method in the multiple character of its genetic conceptions and the tentative interpretation is directed against the radical defect of the two other methods, namely the partiality of intellectual parentage. The effort is to bring up to into view every rational explanation of new phenomenon and to develop every tenable hypothesis respecting their cause and history. The investigator thus becomes the parent of a family of hypotheses, and by his parental relation to all, he is forbidden to fasten his affections on duly upon anyone. In the nature of the case, the danger that springs from affection is counteracted, and therein is a radical difference between this method and the two preceding. The investigator at the outset puts himself in a cordial sympathy and, parent of, and in parental relations of adoption, if not authorship, with every hypothesis that is all applicable to the case under investigation. Having thus neutralized the parentheses of his emotional nature, he proceeds with a certain natural and enforced erectness of mental attitude to the investigation, knowing well that some of his intellectual children will die before maturity, yet feeling several of them may survive the results of final investigation, since it is often the outcome of inquiry that several cases, causes are found to be involved instead of a single one. In following a single hypothesis, the mind is presumably led to a single explanatory conception, but an adequate explanation often involves the coordination of several agencies which enter into the combined result in varying proportions. The true explanation is therefore necessarily complex. Such complex explanations of phenomenon are specifically encouraged by the method of multiple hypotheses and constitute one of its chief merits. We are so prone to attribute a phenomenon to a single cause that when we find an agency present, we are liable to re rest satisfied therewith and fail to recognize that it is but one factor and perchance a minor factor in the accomplishment of the total result. Take for illustration the mooted question of the origin of the Great Lake Basins. We have this, that the other hypotheses urged by different students as the cause of the great activations, and all these are urged with force with the fact urged justly to a certain degree. It is practically demonstrable that these basins were river valleys antecedent to the glacial incision, and that we owe their origin in part to pre-existence of those valleys and to the blocking up of their outlets. And so this view that their origins is urged with a certain truthfulness, so again, it is demonstrable that we were occupied by great lobes of ice which excavated them to a marked degree, and therefore the theory of glacial, glacial excavation finds support in fact. I think it's furthermore demonstrable that the Earth's crust beneath these basins were flexed downward, and that they owe a part of their origin to their crust deformation, but to my judgment, neither one or the other nor the third constitutes an adequate explanation of the phenomenon. All these must be taken together, and possibly they must be supplemented by other agencies. This problem, therefore, is the determination not only of the participation, but of the measure of the extent 
of each of the agencies in production of the complex result. This is not likely to be accomplished by one whose working hypothesis is pre-glacial erosion or glacial erosion or crust deformation, but by one whose staff of working hypothesis embraces all of these and any other agency which can rationally um, conceive to have taken part in the phenomenon. Special merit of the method is that by the, its very nature, it promotes thoroughness. The value of working hypothesis lies largely in its suggestive of lines of inquiry that might otherwise be overlooked. Facts that are trivial in themselves are brought into significance by their bearings upon the hypothesis and by their causal indications. As an illustration, it is necessary to cite the phenomenal influence which the Darwinian hypothesis has exerted upon the investigation of the past two decades, but a single working hypothesis may lead to an investigation along a given line to the neglect of others equally important, and thus, while inquiry is promoted in certain quarters, the investigation lacks completeness, but if all rational hypotheses relating to the subject are worked co-equally, thoroughness is the presumptive result in the very nature of the case. In the use of the multiple method, the reaction of one hypothesis upon another tends to amplify the recognized scope of each, and their mutual conflicts whet the discriminative edge of each. The analytical process, the development and demonstration of criteria, and the sharpening of discrimination receive powerful impulse for the coordinate working on several hypotheses. Fertility in processes is also the natural outcome of this method. Each hypothesis suggests its own criteria, its own means of proof, its own method of developing the truth, and its group of hypothesis encompass the subject on all sides. The total outcome of means and methods is full and rich. The use of the method leads to a certain peculiar habit of mind which deserves passing notice, since as a factor of education, its disciplinary value is one of importance when faithfully pursued for a period of years. It's development a habit of thought analogous to the method itself, which may be designated a habit parallel or complex thought. Instead of a simple succession of thoughts in linear order, the procedure is complex and the mind appears to become possessed of the power of simultaneous vision from different standpoints. Phenomenon appear to become capable of being viewed analytically and synthetically at once, is not altogether unlike the study of landscape for which there comes into mind myriads of lines of intelligence which are received and coordinated simultaneously producing a complex impression which is recorded and studied directly in its complexity. My description of this process is confessedly inadequate and the affirmations of its fact would doubtless challenge dispute at the hands of psychologists of the old school, but I address myself to naturalists who I think can respond to its verity from their own experience. So note, this is in 1890, and it's largely going to be probably artificial intelligence and uh, the computer that allows us to fully implement this. And the, you know, the multiple truth hypothesis of Duvid is basically completely in line uh, with uh, Chamberlain's uh, multiple working hypothesis, and uh, it's an extension. So if you just wanted to use the multiple truth hypothesis as the scientific method of framework that Chamberlain is, is uh, saying here, you could say that the multiple truth hypothesis is an extension of the work of Chamberlain. So let's uh, continue. Drawbacks of the method. The method has, however, its disadvantages. No good thing is without its drawbacks. And this very habit of mind with an invaluable acquisition for purposes of investigation introduces difficulties in expression. It is obvious upon consideration that this method of thought is impossible of verbal expression. We cannot put into words more than a single line of thought at the same time. And even in that the order of expression must be conformed to the idiosyncrasies of language and the rate must be relatively slow. When the habit of complex thought is not highly developed, there is usually a leading line to which others are subordinate and the difficulty of expression does not rise to serious proportions. But when the method of simultaneous vision along different lines is developed so that the thoughts running in different channels are nearly equivalent, there is an obvious embarrassment in selection and the disclination disinclination to make the attempt. Furthermore, the impossibility of expressing the mental operation in words leads to their disuse in the silent process of thought, and hence words and thoughts lose their close association, which they are accustomed to maintain with those whose silent as well spoken thoughts run in linear verbal courses. There is therefore a certain predisposition on the part of the practitioner with this method uh, to taciturnity. We encounter analogous difficulty in the use of the method with young students. 
it is far easier and I think in general more interesting for them to argue a theory or accept simple interpretation than to recognize or evaluate the several factors which the true elucidation may require. To illustrate it is more to their taste to be taught that the Great Lake basins were scooped out by glaciers than to be urged to conceive of three or more great agencies working successfully or simultaneously, and to estimate how much was accomplished by each of these agencies, the complex and the quantitative do not facilitate the young student as they do the veteran investigator. Multiply hypotheses and practical affairs. It has not been our custom to think of the method of working hypothesis as applicable to instruction or to the practical affairs of life. We have usually regarded it as a, but a method of science, but I believe its application to a practical affairs has a value coordinate with the importance of the affairs themselves. I refer especially to those inquiries and inspections that precede the coming out of an enterprise rather than the actual execution. The methods that are superior in scientific investigation should likewise be superior in those investigations that are the necessary antecedents to intelligent conduct of affairs. I can dwell only briefly on the phrase of the subject. In education as an investigation has been much the practice to work a theory. The search for instructional methods has often been proceeded on the presumption that there is a definite pa uh, patent process through which all students might be put and come out with results of maximum excellence, and hence pedagogical inquiry in the past has very largely concerned itself with inquiry, what is the best method, rather than with the inquiry, what are the special values of different methods, and what are their several advantageous applicabilities in the various work of instruction. The past doctrine has been largely the doctrine of pedagogical uniformitarianism, but the faculties and functions of the mind are almost, if not quite, as varied to the properties and function of matter. It is perhaps no less absurd to assume that any specific method of instruction procedure is more effective than all others under any and all circumstances than to assume that on principle of interpretation is equally applicable to all of the phenomena of nature, as there is an endless variety of mental processes and combinations and an indifferent definite number of orders of procedure. The advantage of different methods under different conditions is almost axiomatic. This being granted, there is presented to the teacher the problem of selection and of adoption to meet the need of a, any specific issue that may present itself as important. Therefore, the teacher shall have in mind a full array of possible conditions and states of mind which may be presented in order that when any one of those shall become an actual case, he may recognize and be ready for an emergency. Just as the investigator armed with many working hypotheses is more likely to see the true nature and significance of the phenomenon when they present themselves, so the instructor equipped with a full panoply of hypotheses ready for application more readily recognizes the actuality of the situation more accurately, measures its significance, and more appropriately applies to the method which these cases call for. The application of the method of multiple hypotheses to the varied affairs of life is almost as Brodian to the phases of that life itself, but certain general aspects may be taken as typical of the whole. <coughs> what I have just said respecting the application of the method of instruction may apply with a simple change of terms to almost any other endeavor which we are called upon to undertake. We enter upon an enterprise in most cases without full knowledge of all the factors that we enter into or all the possible phases which it may develop. It is therefore of utmost importance to be prepared to rightly comprehend the nature, bearings, and influence of such unforeseen elements when they shall definitely present themselves in act as actualities. If our vision is narrowed by preconceived theory as to what will happen, we are almost certainly to misinterpret the facts and to misjudge the issue. If on the other hand, we have in mind hypothetical forecast of the various contingencies that may arise, we shall be more likely to recognize the facts, true facts when they do present themselves instead of being biased by the anticipation of a given fa phrase, a phase, the mind is rendered open and alert by the anticipation, anticipation of any one of many phases and if, is free not only but is predisposed to recognize correctly the one which does appear. The method has further good effect. The mind, having anticipated the possible phases which may arise, has prepared itself for action under any one that may come up and is therefore ready armed and is predisposed to act in line appropriate to the event. It has not set itself rigidly in a fixed purpose which is predisposed 
to follow without regard to run a specific course, whether rocks lie in the path or not. But with the helm in hand, it is ready to veer the ship according to his danger or advantage, advantage discovers itself. It is true there are often advantages in pursuing a fixed determined course with regard to obstacles or adverse conditions. Simple dog resolution is sometimes salvation of an enterprise, but while glorious successes have been thus snatched from the very brink of disaster, overwhelming calamity has in other cases followed upon this course when a reasonable regard for the unanticipated elements would have led to success. So there is to be set over against the great achievements that followed on dog adherence to great distances, which are equally its results. Okay, yes, I'm reading this whole article because Basically, this 1890 paper of Chamberlain on uh, the working uh, multiple uh, working hypothesis is the precursor uh, to the multiple truth hypothesis. And basically, everything Chamberlain is saying um, you know, could be directly applied to uh, how I'm going to continue um, the expansion of Chamberlain's multiple working hypothesis theory of 1890. Danger of vacillation. The tendency of the mind to custom to work through multiple hypotheses is to sway to one line of policy or another, according as the balance of evidence shall incline. This is the soul and essence of the method is generally the true method. Nevertheless, there is a danger that this yielding to evidence may degenerate into unwarranted vacill vacillation. It is not always possible for the mind to balance evidence with exact equipose and to determine the midst of the execution of enterprise what is the measure of probability on the one side or the other and the difficulties, present danger of being biased by them and of swerving from the course that was really the true one. Certain limitations are therefore to be placed upon the application of the method, for it must be remembered that the poor line of policy consistently adhered to may bring better results than a, a vacillation between better policies. There is another and closely allied danger in the application of the method. In its highest development, it presumes the mind supremely sensitive to every grain of evidence, like a pair of delicately poised scales. Every added particle on the one side or the other produces its effect in oscillation, but such a pair of scales may be altogether too sensitive to be of practical value in the rough affairs of life. The balances of these exact chemists are too delicate for the weighing out of coarse commodities. Dispatch may be more important than accuracy, so it is possible for the mind to be too much concerned with the nice balancings of evidence and to oscillate too much and too long in the endeavor to react to reach exact results. It may be better if the gross affairs of life to be less precise and more prompt. Quick decisions, though they may contain a grain of error, are oftentimes better than precise definitions at the expense of time. It has a special benefit application to our social and civic relations. Into these relations there enter as great factors our judgment and others, our discernment of the nature of the acts and our interpretations of their motives and purpose. The method of multiple hypotheses in this application here stands in decided contrast to the method of ruling theory or the simple working hypothesis. The primitive habits is to interpret the acts of others on the basis of theory. Childhood unconscious theory is that the good are good and that the bad are bad. From the good, the child expects nothing uh, but the good. From the bad, nothing but the bad. To expect a good act from the bad or a bad act from the good is radically at variance with a childhood's mental methods. Unfortunately, in social and civic affairs, too many of our fellow citizens have never outgrown the ruling theory from their childhood. Many advance a step further and employ a method analogous to that of the working hypothesis. A certain presumption is made to attach to the acts of their fellow beings, and that which they see is seen in the light of that presumption. They do not go to the length of the childhood method by assuming positively that the good are wholly good and that the bad are wholly bad, but there is a strong presumption in their minds that he is concerning whom they have all an ill opinion will act from corresponding motives. It requires positive evidence to overthrow the influence of the working hypothesis. The method of multiple hypothesis assumes broadly that the acts of a fellow being may be diverse in their nature, their motives, their purpose, and hence in their whole moral character, that they may be good through the dominant character uh, be bad, that they may be bad, though the dominant character be good, that they may be partly good and partly bad, as in fact, in the greater number of the complex activities of human beings under the method of multiple hypothesis, it is the first effort of the mind to see truly what the act is, unbeclouded by the presumption that this 
or that has been done because it accords with our ruling theory or working hypothesis, assuming that the acts of similar gener general aspect may readily take any one of several different phases the mind is freer to see accurately what has actually been done so again in our interpretation of motives and purposes the method assumes that these may have been any one of many and the first duty is to ascertain which of the possible motives and purposes actually prompted this individual action going with this effort there is a predisposition to balance all evidence fairly and to accept the interpretation to which the weight of evidence inclines not that which simply fits our working hypothesis or dominant theory. The outcome, therefore, is better and a truer observation and juster and more righteous interpretations. Okay, Church of Entropy, thanks for joining. You'll see this uh, 1890 paper of Chamberlain um, is really uh, intuiting Freud and it's intuiting um, cognitive dissonance theory, imperfections of knowledge. There's a third result of great importance, the imperfection of our knowledge and more likely to be detached for there will be a less confidence in its completeness and proportion. And there is a broad comprehension of the possibilities of varied action under similar circumstances with similar appearances. So also the imperfections of evidence as to the motives and purposes inspiring the action will become more discernible in proportion to the fullness of our conception of what the evidence should be to distinguish between action from one or the other possible motives, the necessary result will be less disposition to reach conclusions upon imperfect grounds. So also there will be less inclination to misapply evidence for several constructions being definitely in mind. The indices of one motive are less liable to be mistaken for the indices of another. The total outcome is greater care in asserting the facts and greater discrimination and caution in drawing conclusion, I'm confident, therefore, to the general application of the method to the affairs of social and civic life would go far to remove those misunderstandings, misjudgments, and misrepresentations, which constitute so pervasive an evil in our social and our political atmospheres, the source of immeasurable suffering to the best and most sensitive souls, the misobservations, the misstatements, the misinterpretations of life may cause less gross suffering than some other evils, but be they being more universal and more subtle pain. The remedy lies indeed partly in, in charity, but more largely in correct intellectual habits in a predominant ever-present disposition to see things as they are and to judge them in full light of an unbiased weighing of evidence applied to all possible constructions accompanied by a withholding of judgment when the evidence is insufficient to justify conclusions. I believe that one of the greatest moral reforms that lies immediately before us consists in the general introduction into social and civic life of that habit of mental processes, which are known as investigations of the method of multiple working hypotheses. So uh, just an end note on this paper. Chamberlain published two papers under the title The Method of Multiple Working Hypotheses. One of these papers first published in the Journal of Geology, 1897. It was quoted by Platt in his recent article, Strong Inference. Uh, Platt wrote, 1964, this charming paper deserves to be reprinted. Several readers, having had difficulty obtaining copies of Chamberlain paper, expressed agreement with Platt. One wrote that the article had been reprinted in the Journal of Geography in 1931 and the Scientific Monthly of November of 1944. Another sent us a photocopy several months later. Still another wrote that the Institute of Human uh, Studies had reprinted the article in a pamphlet from this year. On consulting the 1897 version, we found a footnote in which Chamberlain has written a paper on the subject was read before the Society of Western Naturalists in 1892 and was published in a scientific periodical. Library research revealed that a scientific periodical was science itself from 7th of February, 1890, and that Chamberlain had actually read the paper before the Society of Western Naturalists on the 25th of October in 1889. The chief difference between the 1890 text and the 1897 uh, text is that Chamberlain wrote in 1897, the article has been freely altered and abbreviated so as to limit its aspects related to the geological study. The 1890 text, which seemed to be the first and most general version of the multiple method of multiple working hypothesis is reprinted here. So this method of multiple working hypothesis. So Duvid was looking, uh, you know, for the multiple truth hypothesis, which I had kind of coined this uh, terminology, and I was looking to see if there was a similar theory. And, you know, I did a Google search, 
and I came up on this uh, method of multiple working hypothesis. And uh, in generally, I think uh, you this is pretty much in line with the, the multiple truth hypothesis. Although, although I might be saying more fundamental things about the nature of reality and the question of what is actually truth. You know, the distance between our working models or combinations of models that are somewhat predictive of material real reality uh, versus some estimization of what the actual truth is. And then obviously the multiple truth hypothesis would leave open that uh, you know, there could possibly be multiple true theories and that there could possibly be multiple conflicting theories. Um, but we'll leave that for a little bit later. So let's keep it going. I really got a lot of material to present. And uh, let's look a little bit in terms, you know, just jumping from uh, uh, just jumping from uh, what we were talking about, uh, Chamberlain's 1890 paper to the current state of computer science and artificial intelligence. And uh, what happens when we turn this search for the truth over to the computer? Because you recognize the limitation of human knowledge and human potential to uh, discern the truth or to you know, work with all these multiple things at the same time. And uh, the computer obviously today is much better at doing these things. And like Duvid works with like multi-physics platforms and uh, um, you know, where they have you know, multi-physics, different sections like electricity and magnetism or uh, sound or, or various sections that physics has been divided into and then the equations are applied and so you could test materials or engineering outcomes based on different sections of physics or you could test uh, you know largely on all of the the available things and sometimes there'll be conflicting ones and is there a universal picture uh, of scientific laws and what the scientific laws actually say is reality but on a social aspect of, uh, you know, there's a lot of things like, uh, you know, news, truth, uh, fact checking. So let, let's look at this paper. I'm going to look a lot more into this in future streams. And uh, this part of uh, artificial intelligence is going to be a fundamental pillar of the multiple truth hypothesis. So on the discovery of evolving truth. In the era of big data, information regarding the same objects can be collected from increasingly more sources. Unfortunately, there usually exist conflicts among the information coming from different sources. To tackle this challenge, truth discovery, to integrate multi-source noisy information by estimating the reliability of each source has emerged as a hot topic. In many real-world applications, however, the information may come se sequentially, and as a consequence, the truth of objects as well as the reliability of sources may be dynamically evolving. Existing truth discovery methods, unfortunately, cannot handle such scenarios. To address this problem, we investigate the temporal relations among both object truths and source reliability and propose an incremental truth discovery framework that can dynamically update object truths and source weights upon the arrival of new data. Theoretical analysis is provided to show that the proposed method is guaranteed to converge at a fast rate the experiments on three world applications as a set of synthetic data demonstrate the advantages of the proposed method over state-of-the-art truth discovery methods. So there's actually going to be multiple methods of truth discovery, um, but I'm showing this now as kind of an involvement to um, Chamberlain's uh, multiple working hypothesis, where what if you could turn that over to the computer and what if the computer gave some sort of numeric value to the multiple working hypothesis to estimate the value of what they're doing? And you know, so that the multiple truth hypothesis is going to move towards this creation of a numeric mathematics for what Chamberlain talks about. So nowadays, with information explosion, it becomes much more convenient to collect information from multiple places. For example, to know the weather condition of a specific location 
we can get the information from multiple weather services to get the up-to-date information about some stocks, multiple web states, and recording the real-time information to query for flight status. Multiple agencies may provide such information. However, these collected informations could conflict with each other. To better utilize the collected multi-source information, an important task is to resolve the conflicts among them and to output the trustworthy information. In the light of this challenge, troop discovery is emerging as a promising paradigm and can help people identify trustworthy information from multiple noisy information sources and has been applied in various application domains. In contrast to voting or averaging approaches that treat all sources equally, troop discovery method estimates the source reliability and further trustworthy information simultaneously as the source reliability degrees are usually known a priori in troop discovery. Source reliability, estimation, and trustworthy information inference are tightly combined by the following principle. If a source provides trustworthy information more often, it will be assigned a high reliability. Meanwhile, if one piece of information is claimed by high quality sources, it would be regarded as trustworthy information. Most of the existing proof discovery algorithms are proposed to work on static data. They cannot handle the scenarios where the collected information comes sequentially, which happens in most real world applications. Consider the aforementioned applications, the weather condition, the stock information, the flight status are collected in real time. These applications reveal the necessity, reveal the necessity to develop troop discovery methods for such scenarios. In the scenarios that information is collected continuously, new challenges are brought by the nature of such applications. First, as data comes sequentially from multiple sources in a dynamic environment, we cannot afford to rerun the batch al algorithm at each timestamp. Instead, we need approaches that scan data once and conduct real-time troop discovery to facilitate processing and storage on large-scale data. Unfortunately, existing troop discovery approaches are not developed to handle dynamic streaming data. They work in batch processing manner and cannot incrementally update troop or source reliability. Second, unique characteristics of dynamic data are observed across various real-world applications. The true information of objects evolve over time, and for a specific object, the temporal smoothness exists among its information at different timestamps. The observed source reliability changes over time, which is not consistent with the assumption held by existing approaches as they assume the source has unchanged reliability. In section two, we will illustrate more details about these observations and discuss the difficulties that they bring to truth discovery. To tackle the aforementioned two challenges in this paper, a new truth discovery method is developed for dynamic scenarios. We first propose an effective solution that can update truth and source reliability in an incremental fashion. Thus, the proposed method can work in real time and the data only needs to be visited once. To capture the unique characteristics of dynamic data, two factors, namely smoothing factor and decay factor, are incorporated into the proposed approach to model the evolution of both truth and source reliability. Further, we give theoretical analysis for the proposed method and show its fast rate of convergence. To demonstrate the effectiveness and effic uh, eff efficiency of the proposed method, we conduct a series of experiments on three world applications and a set of synthetic data sets by comparing this with the state-of-the-art truth discovery method. The improvements brought by the proposed method is justified. We also analyze the effect of smoothing factor and decay factor, explain how these factors can capture the characteristics of dynamic data and test the sensitivity of the proposed method with respect to these three factors. In summary, our contribution in this paper are motivated by many real world applications. We study the truth discovery task under dynamic scenarios in which information is collected continuously and evolution exists in both truths and source reliability. We developed an incremental truth discovery method that can be applied in real-time scenarios. Two more factors are incorporated into the proposed method to capture the characteristics of dynamic data. Theoretical analysis is presented to prove the convergence of a proposed method. The rate of convergence is also given. We test the proposed method of the three world applications and several synthetic data sets, and the improvements of both performance accuracy and efficiencies are demonstrated. So this uh, concept of truth discovery is something that I'm going to be uh, talking about quite a bit. So uh, as of now, I just wanted to bring it out there as uh, something like a, a, um, your application of uh, Chamberlain's multiple working hypothesis in current um, computer science and artificial intelligence. So uh, 
I do plan on uh, covering this much more in depth, and we will be talking uh, quite a, quite a bit more about uh, these uh, computer artificial intelligence methods of getting at truth. But you could imagine the mathematicalized form as the general formulation of um, the multiple truth hypothesis. And actually, I, I probably closed that uh, too quickly because I think uh, you could see that this is actually um, mathematical. And they introduce uh, a language here for truth discovery. So, you know, I had the estimate of kind of an equation for the multiple truth hypothesis. But this paper of uh, the compu of computer uh, mathematical truth discovery is, is largely forma uh, formulaic. Okay, so Church of Entropy, Jen, uh, Jennifer, appreciate her being in the chat, moderating, and uh, Yuan, anyone, uh, anyone joining? So I got a few more papers on the scientific background. This is a huge um, thesis, Doctor of, of uh, Philosophy, from, I guess it's someone in Greece, and he really goes in-depth, uh, big time, into these disputes into uh, the philosophy of science. And this is a, you know, a doctoral thesis at the London School of Economics and Political Science, the Department of International Relations. Let me just quickly read this abstract, and I'm not gonna have, you know, this is 400 pages. Um, the thesis sets out the challenge, the assumption widely held among international relations scholars that scientific realism is the definite and final interpretation of realism. The introduction of scientific realism into international relations as the latter's proper meta theory has been the incentive for the very intense debates about both meta theoretical and theoretical international relations issues. I argue that IR has uncritically adopted the strongest version of SR scientific realism. This can be seen by comparing the different versions of SR and their anti realist alternatives as these have developed in the philosophy of science literature. To the version of SR which was introduced to, into IR, it is critical realism, however, a version of SR that originated with Roy Bhaskar, which has dominated SR debate in IR. This development has had negative consequences with respect to the quality of argumentation about realism in international relations. This notwithstanding a positive implication, of the situation is that IR scholars who belong in various traditions of thought have criticized SR from different theoretical angles and thus shed light on many of its shortcomings. I elaborate in the comments uh, that have been made on meta theoretical as well as theoretical issues and come up with my own conclusions about SR and CR in this framework. I also deal with two special issues which have arisen from the debate's uh, problematic peak, the question about whether reasons can be causes which lies in the foundation of Wendt's constitutive explanation and the challenges of metatheoretical hypochondria, according to which the extent of concern with meta theory takes place at the expense of theorizing real world political problems. Last, I show by way of novel contribution that Wendt's latest undertaking of a quantum social science, although compatible with SR, suffers inconsistencies and misunderstandings in terms of the methodology, metaphysics, and use of quantum mechanics and applications to IR. This thesis is an interdisciplinary study which draws on the philosophy of science, international relations, and physics, namely quantum mechanics, in order to scrutinize the use of, of uh, scientific realism and critical realism into international relations along with the implications of both IR meta theory and IR theory. And so this paper from the perspective of international relations is looking at the role of scientific realism in international relations. Um, and it's a whole book, 400 page book. Uh, but you know, from that, his chapter on scientific realism is really quite exceptional. So just read a, a little bit of this. Um, this chapter is devoted to critical exposition of the concept of scientific realism and its associated set of claims about theory, knowledge, and reality. As a view of science and scientific practice, scientific realism should not be confused with realism in philosophy of language, in philosophy of mathematics, or in political realism and non-realism. Scientific realism is a mature, autonomous pursuit of the philosophy of science, drawing mostly from the natural sciences and their history. 
as will be described in more detail, scientific realism has been appe applied, appealed to several times in the more recent meta-theoretical debates of international relations. So as a result, uh, so he goes on to an extremely in-depth explanation of the various schools. So let's just get a little definition. What is scientific realism? is essentially a doctrine about ontological commitment to scientific posits and theoretical entities. The core idea lies in the conviction that mature science and the posits of mature science are generally true in an ontological demanding sense. Scientific theories and hypotheses refer to real entities, whether the middle size entities of common sense or unobservable entities, forces and relations, theoretical claims should be taken literally, potentially referring to mind independent reality whose details science itself studies. Most scientific realists ally themselves closely with philosophical naturalism. Metaphysically, this entails that realists tend to prefer empirical arguments no different, at least in principle, from the kinds of arguments scientists put forward and broadly naturalistic theories of meaning, reference, and knowledge. Last but not least, most scientific realists take it to that abduction, namely inference, to the best explanation is a legitimate and reliable method to identify the best potential explanation of a natural phenomenon. The debate over scientific realism developed principally in the past 30 years. Historically, SR became the dominant philosophy of science as a reaction to logical positivism. The logical positivists construed scientific theories and hypotheses largely as instruments of calculation or as convenient systems through which scientists summarize the empirical regularities of observable entities and processes. Apparently, unobservables were deemed to be too metaphysical for positive strictures. Instead of taking them to refer to actual unobservable entities and processes, the logical positives preferred to explain them away either instrumentally or reductively. However, this instrumental or reductive stance soon became challenged under the guidance of such figures as Karl Popper, Maxwell, Smart in the 60s, the philosophy of science took the so-called realist turn, adopting science as a guide to truth, but ontology and epistemology, both ontologically and epistemology. Out of the ensuing exchanges of ideas, there developed a complex, multidimensional philosophical debate which sophisticated arguments for and against scientific realism. The current criticism of SR stems mostly from skeptically oriented empiricists, constructivists, verificationists, and other so-called anti-realists. The central issue today has been over how to interpret scientific theories in order to understand the progress of science. However, defining SR is not an easy task. Uh, Chernoff notes over the years, SR has taken vastly different forms, including inferential realism, abductive inference to the best explanation, fiduciary realism, where credibility is at the core, uh, bivalence realism, according to which all statements are either true or false, entity realism, restricting SR to claims about theoretical entities and excluding claims about theoretical truth, uh, theoretical causal realism, restricting the positing of theoretical entity uh, to those having causal status, and referential realism, according to which all entities and scientific theories have genuine ontic status. Amid these various th uh, varieties of SR, one can nonetheless discern a family of views concerning truth, explanation, reference, and progress with their own metaphysical, epistemological, and semantic divisions. Realists disagree among themselves about which of these views should be given priority over others. All these views, though, take for granted that realism ab about truth and reality should be preferred over any anti-realist constructivist counterparts. So he goes on, you know, hundreds of pages. I encourage people to try to read through the whole thing. Um, but if you wanted a up-to-date overview of all of the um, – breakdown of the current philosophy of science, what does science know about truth, what's the connection between these scientific processes and truth in the various schools, and kind of this dominant theory of critical realism, scientific realism that's dominating pseudo-scientific fields like international relations, psychology, and I'm actually going to read from a nursing document to show further maybe the, the direction of uh, Jennifer, and then I have uh, five articles on cognitive dissonance because uh, anyone who's been you know paying attention to Chamberlain the structures of the multiple working hypothesis is basically saying that the mind naturally does cognitive dissonance theory is saying that the the mind naturally performs that and as a result we have uh, this uh, 
phenomenon known as cognitive dissonance, but cognitive dissonance is um, the result of a natural process of however the mind creates consciousness of working through multiple working hypotheses. So I'm not sure if uh, what Jennifer's schedule is or if she wants to come on. Um, so let me read. I'm going to read quite a bit from this paper, so it'll probably take me like 30 minutes. So if Jennifer does want to come on, um, maybe in about 30 minutes um, when I'm done reading this, and then we could move to dissonance and you could share some of your thoughts and uh, maybe you could help me out uh, just so I could uh, – you know, finish all this information. So I'm gonna. This uh, is actually from Nursing Inquiry, Inquiry, a journal of nursing. It has a very good overview um, of including scientific realism, of uh, you know, kind of the state of uh, science and truth, and uh, um, so I'm gonna read a good portion of this just to get these definitions out there. And, you know, these words familiar going off my tongue and for people who are you know, watching and following uh, my stuff and interested in uh, um, in this will. Uh, wow, I just check in here. Bitchute officially tagged me. Uh, Bitchute Jacob Asa, the destruction of Amalek uh, with no more news and Reb Duvid. Um, so uh, Bitchute itself uh the company is uh, supporting uh, Duvid on their platform. Awesome. Okay, so uh, so let's get to work here in this nursing, and it's going to be um, we're going to look at uh, um, uh, what's this theory here? I apologize. Uh, um, Carper's Carper has a certain theory, and and this is now the attempt. We're going to be taking other factors besides science and putting it into truth. So here from nursing, the nurses are looking, what does the scientific realism say about the state of medicine, anatomy, and what, you know, scientifically, like what me and Church of Entropy discussed on Week in Review, the alleviation of pain, versus other useful sources of information that have value to nurses and the performance of their function and how to weigh those various factors together. And they don't really have even uh, Chamberlain's, uh, you know, uh, theory of mo multiple working hypotheses. They probably hadn't read that, that, or you know, let alone Duvid's uh, multiple truth hypothesis. But just as a precursor to see, um, you know, the multiple truth hypothesis is uh, this article on nursing is, uh, you know, should really help but nail in the scientific uh, background and the, you know, where Duvid's multiple truth hypothesis, and then hopefully uh, after I read maybe even a full 30 minutes of this, we'll bring uh, Jennifer on, and uh, we'll talk specifically about the science of cognitive dissonance and uh, the similarity of this multiple working hypothesis to the supposed method uh, mechanisms of cognitive dissonance. Okay, ways of knowing realism, non-realism, Nominalism and a typology revisited with a counter perspective for nursing sciences by Garrett and Hutling out of the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Ways of knowing realism, non realism, nominalism, and typological revisited with a computer, a counter perspective for nursing science. In this paper, we consider the context of Barbara Carper's alternative ways of knowing a prominent discourse in modern nursing theory in North America. We explore this relative to the concepts of realism, non-realism, and nominalism, and investigate the philosophical divisions behind the original typology, particular in relationship to modern scientific uh, inquiry. We examine forms of knowledge relative to realist and nominalist positions and make an argument ad absurdum against relativistic interpretations of knowledge using the example of Borge's Chinese Imperium and benevolent knowledge. We reproduce a contentious post-positivist practical classification for nursing knowledge that demonstrates and supports the idea that knowledge has both individual and subjective components. This classification supports the practical applications of nursing knowledge within the paradigm of realist post-positivistic science. So now and, you know, people have got a little idea of what this multiple truth hypothesis thing is. We'll see the application um, 
from this nurse's perspective at how they should go about searching for the truth. So the rise of alternative epistemologies. One of the most popular lines of thought that is frequently expressed in nursing is the notion that there are different ways of knowing in the explanation of phenomenon. This idea that there are different ways of knowing things is certainly not new and forms the basis of any philosophical and epistemological argument about the nature of knowledge and justified belief. However, the principle that multiple forms of knowledge should be regarded as equally valid as forms of explanation is more modern proposition arising from the postmodern movement of the 1970s and contemporary American uh, pragmatism. Carper's four different ways of knowing, empirical, ethical, personal, and aesthetic, was developed in this manner is often used in this epistemological basis for nursing knowledge. This approach adopts a rejection of scientific realism, embraces anomalous perspective, and so the theoretical justification behind this particular framework is worth re-exploring at the very least to avoid its becoming another form of dogma within the profession of these arguments have become a central discourse in nursing. Realist, anomalist, and non-realist perspectives of knowledge. Carper's typology rests upon anomalous perspective of inquiry. A full discussion of realism, anomalism, and non-realism is beyond the scope of this paper. Is there many forms of such naive realism? The sense uh, provide direct awareness of the external world. Moral relativism, ethical propositions can represent truth. Transcendental realism, the scientific study of reality requires phenomena to have manipulable internal mechanisms that can be actualized to produce specific outcomes. Bakshar and irrealism, the existence of multiple actual worlds, to name but a few. Scientific realism represents a philosophical field that has a vast amount of written about it and is clearly linked to older philosophical views, including empiricism, rationalism, and positivism. Nevertheless, it is important to review the key arguments and distinctions here as they are fundamental in understanding arguments about the generation of knowledge behind Carper's typology and Duvid's multiple truth hypothesis in general. Scientific realism. The thoughts behind realism go back to the ancient Greeks and were discussed by Socrates, Plato, Platonic thinking holds the abstract ideas to find concrete realities, and Aristotle, among others, scientific realism represents the view that we ought to believe in a shared mind, independent or objective reality that includes both observable and unobservable phenomena. However, realism really became the dominant philosophy of science following the demise of anti-realist arguments of the logical positivists in the 1950s, when doubts arose about the their mutually exclusive separation of objects and theories in describing the world. Scientific realism presents two fundamental positions. First, that the essence of things is objective and given in nat nature, and even though our perceptions of them may be subjective, they continue to exist outside our perception. Therefore, the world as described by empirical science represents a mind-independent, often called objective, real world that we should be able to describe by using scientific theories. Second, that scientific inquiry will eventually produce theories analogous to ideal scientific theories that accurately describe phenomena. For some realists, an ideal scientific theory has also been described as one where the things described by it exist objectively and independent of the thinker and claims made in the explanatory theory are considered true in the sense that they accurately explain a phenomenon given our existing knowledge. Therefore, there's good reason to believe in the theory. Another important aspect often argued by scientific realists is that the universe contains things that can all be described in scientific terms and science strives for explanations that apply universally. Universals are characteristics or qualities that things commonly hold and as such are repeatable or recurrent entities. Universals are often considered a fundamental feature of scientific realism, although not all proponents would agree. So realism is then rather more complex than it may first appear, as it involves both the description of things that represent the world accurately and the notion of mind-independent truths. Various arguments have been advanced in support of scientific realism over the years, such as the no miracles argument, offered by Roy Bashkar and Hilary Putman in 1975. Putman wrote, the positive argument for realism is that the only philosophical philosophy that doesn't make the success of science a miracle. Putman later revised his earlier ideas on scientific realism and moved away from universals. Arguing does not make sense to say that the terms of one theory refer to real things, whereas the terms of another do not. 
or that one theory rather than another is absolutely true or true by virtue of there being a unique correspondence between the terms in which it is expressed. For example, if we consider the concept of pain, there are a number of theoretical models that are compatible with an explanation of the phenomenon. And for Putman, an assumption that one specific model will give a complete truth or a final representation would be considered a practical limitation given the nature of evolution of knowledge development. These ideas were later developed in the form of pragmatist argument, but Putman remains a defender of scientific realism and what he calls natural realism that rejects an interface conception of the mind with reality asserting that human perception and cognition spread all the way to real objects themselves. Other scientific realists, notably Boyd, uh, notably Boyd, adopted logically similar versions of the no miracles argument. Boyd argues that the operational successes of a theory lends credence to the idea that its unobservable aspects exist because they were the basis on which the predictions were originally made. Amelism. On the other hand, philosophers have frequently criticized the value of scientific realism and empirical explanations to adequately describe the universe, particularly using ontological of uh, the nature of being and epistemological arguments about whether universal truths exist. The terms anti-realism and nominalism are often uh, synonymously uh, used to describe the positions that contest the existence of objective truths and the principles of mind-independent reality. John Stuart Mill suggested an early version proposing there was nothing universal except names, hence the prefix nomen. Nominalist criti uh, critics often argue that scientific realism and all other forms of explanation require us to accept truths on the basis of the abstract conceptualization of things known as abstract objects. Abstract objects are complex to define but can be considered entities which have no physical form and do not exist on any particular time or place, but rather exist as a type of thing. For example, philosophically, the concepts of justice or quality are considered abstract objects, whereas things that have a specific form, such as sports car or white wine, are considered concrete objects. The problem with universals that nominalists often challenge is their technical ontological status, particularly the argument as to whether universals exist independently of things or if they are simply convenient ways of finding likeness between particular items that are completely different. This has led philosophers to raise questions of universals or abstract objects do exist, where do they exist within the thing known as the re or in the minds of the people or in some separate metaphysical domain separate from the entity they applied to. Notice the anti rem Like realism, many different varieties of nominalism have been developed. Uh, we have uh, institutionalists, anti-realists in respect to mathematical objects who suggest the existence of mathematical objects is dependent upon our ability to prove them. Idealist idealism who suggests that all reality as we know it is fundamentally uh, mentally constructed and phenomenalist phenomenalism who hold that the view that physical objects do not exist as things in themselves but as perceptual or sensory phenomenon such as specific colors or taste generally nominalist position hold that concepts in the existence of objects are particular to the individual and reality construed by the individual and so do not accept the notion of true false statements that verify the existence of universal entities or theories Philosophically, nominalists challenge the existence of either universals or abstract objects in support of relativistic explanations of knowledge. So for people who follow uh, Duvid regularly, you could probably say Church of Entropy is more in the school of scientific realism and Duvid is more in the school of nominalism. Non-realism. Finally, number non uh, however, the multiple truth hypothesis would frame this uh, search for truth uh, in a way that uh, it would uh, give equal credence to all of these various schools. So non-realism. Finally, a number of non-realist empirical philosophical approaches to science have also been suggested over the years. They're often referred to as empirical non-realism or simply non-realism. These generally accept the principles of a common shared real reality inherent in scientific realism, but have treated its nature and the notions of universal truths and theories differently. Ernest Mach, for example, put an instrumentalist empirical position forward as an alternative to scientific realism. His pragmatic views was the concept or theory should be evaluated on how effectively explains and predicts phenomena rather than how accurately describes a mind independent reality. In a related approach, uh, Percy Bridgman suggests that in order to explain a concept, we must have a method of measurement for it, 
by which we mean any concept is nothing more than a set of operations. Thomas Kuhn characterized scientific inquiry as a competent competing paradigms, and his work has had a strong influence on the opponents of scientific realism. He gave his work an anti-realistic element by denying the idea that theories could be regarded as more or less close to the truth as they change with different scientific paradigms. This has led many to claim his work supports postmodern nominalism. Nevertheless, Kuhn supported the notion of a shared common reality and the principles of empiricism, and that changes in scientific paradigms occur through a conversion process with faith in the future ability of a paradigm to make successful truth claims about reality. However, like Ernest Mach, he saw science as a problem-solving activity with his emphasis on truth and reality diminished and outcomes being regarded as more important. In this sense, his ideas can be argued as closer to empirical and are better associated with non-realism. Similar, Bas uh, Van Frossen has suggested that the aim of science is not to find true theories, but only theories that are empirically adequate. The latest form of non-realist explanations is that of the complexity science. Under the rubric of complexity theory, different kinds of complex systems have been studied, compared, contrasted, and mathematically modeled. As a result, an abstract understanding of the systems that span the physical, biological, and social sciences has been postulated. Complexity scientists support empiricism, but argue that generally nature is not amenable to the reductionist methods of traditional science because nature is made up of what complexity scientists call nonlinear complex systems. These non-realist perspectives are distinct from nominalist approaches in that they represent epistemological arguments that accept the principal value of an empirical basis for evidence. They represent a form of post-positivist thinking. Science and culture. One aspect that is regarded regularly discussed in these debates is that science itself is culturally derived. Modern science, despite having obvious multiple historic origins from around the world, is often subject to the criticism of Eurocentrism and its approach. The European tradition is argued as seeing itself as objective observers standing back and separate from the world rather than just other cultural perceptions of being integrated within it. In recent years, there's been a move in many disciplines to account for this in a more integrative science that borrows from more traditional cultural perceptions and expresses for more traditional cultural perceptions and expresses itself in systems approaches. Proponents of this have promoted a greater sense of holism in science, placing greater emphasis on the relationship rather than cause and effect. These approaches have been seen in a number of fields, notably both health and earth sciences, with examples of integrative oncology, and transformative earth sciences. However, these approaches neatly sidestep the philosophical issues of realism and nominalism by simply avoiding taking a position. However, they do promote acceptance of a perception through our intuitive faculties of mind-body approach that certainly seem to lean towards nominalist arguments. Okay, so now we move on to Carper, uh, this nursing theory uh, that uh, really is a uh, quite a bit in line with multiple truth hypothesis. So, you know, this uh, introduction, you know, the Carper's typology of the late 1970s is uh, also like Chamberlain of 1890, a precursor to Duvid's multiple truth hypothesis of 2020, 50 years later. Barbara Carper's typology in the late 1970s is a classic example using the promotion of alternative epistemological understanding in nursing. Her ideas were certainly influenced by the postmodern neo-American pragmatist as philosophical movements, uh, also likely feminist pragmatist ideas of the late 20th century, therefore is worth exploring the ge genealogy of her ideas. Pragmatism and neo-pragmatism. Charles Sanders Pierce is recognized as the originator of pragmatism, arguing that any other theory that proved itself more successful in predicting and controlling our world than others could be considered to be more valuable and nearer the truth. For example, the theory of the heart as a pump in a cardiovascular system proved more effective in treating illness than the early Egyptian beliefs that the heart was the source of human wisdom. This pragmatic view focused on the outcomes of scientific research and theories as the key focus of the practical value as knowledge. Later work by the American William James recognized this conceptualization, but emphasized the context of inquiry as an important influence in the conduct of scientific work, and that the value of any truth was, in, was dependent upon its use to the person who held it. Another view of pragmatism, and one that is probably more congruent with modern science, is that of the American John Dewey. Dewey viewed knowledge as arising from an active adaption of humans to their environment and in a state of flux rather than fixed and immutable but was not as pluralist or relativist as James views. He stated that value was not a function, uh, not a whim, 
nor purely a social construction. Do we also support the importance of experimental inquiry and argue the value of practical knowledge resulted from establishing correlations between events with experimentation? Do we held the ideas were simply instruments or tools that humans use to make sense of the world? Another early supporter of these ideas was Jane Addams, a philosopher and social reformer. Her Adams' main role in the development of American pragmatism was focused on developing a social philosophy infused with a class and gender consciousness. Adams represented an early incarnation of the feminist pragmatism movement. And in terms of the generation of knowledge, her conceptions was more aligned with Jane's idea in their social setting of inquiry affected in the nature of knowledge and its value to particular social groups. These early pragmatist thinkers have been known as the classical pragmatists. However, there has been an emergence of a newer postmodern neo-pragmatist Tag neo pragmatism developed by the American philosopher Richard Wardy, um, that was simulated by the work of John Dewey, Martin Heidegger, William von Orman Quinn, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Wilfred Seller, and Jacques Derrida. Wardy developed a distinctive and controversial form of pragmatism that involved abandoning the view of thought or language as a mirror of reality or external world, arguing that truth was not about accuracy of representing reality, but was part of a social practice and language. Uh, was what served our particular purposes at a time. They rejected an external view of the world where objective knowledge is achieved through singular truthful accounts of phenomenon, but instead proposed that there are multiple truths. Feminist par pragmatists have also taken up these arguments. Some of the new ideas on pragmatism have been argued by Putman and Quinn, although neither identifies themselves as neo-pragmatists. In some ways, it can be argued that American neo-pragmatism has become more embedded in ontological arguments rather than epistemological ones. And today the label of pragmatism and nursing has become more synonymous with postmortem nominalist positions and explaining phenomena in terms of social cultural considerations used to justify the generation of knowledge and its value. <coughs> Although the focus has been on positive optimistic interpretations, essentially proponents argue that one can analyze an event from differing personally and social perspectives and so technically any means to a practically demonstrable outcome can use as a justification and represent a valid explanatory framework with varying forms of this argument. This is very different from modern post-positivist scientific pragmatism that argues for consideration of competing hypotheses and for the selection of a best empirical evidence explanatory framework that works in practice, while not necessarily regarding this as truth, but as a practical working state of knowledge. The only real similarity between these very different forms of pragmatism is the focus on practical outcomes and action, praxis. Okay, so four forms of knowing. So Carper drew on the postmodern neo-American pragmatist ideas that knowledge is generational, uh, knowledge generation was influenced by the communities of inquirers and particularly their ethics, aesthetics, and personal experiences as intersecting influences in their community of inquiry. Like many nursing researchers over time, she adopted anomalous stance and proposed a creation, a creative typology of fundamental ways of knowing that classifies the different sources from which knowledge and beliefs can be derived. This was specifically applied to nursing knowledge accepting the post-modern uh, pragmatic notion that the acquisition of knowledge occurs differentially in different community, differently in different communities or cultures. The resulting typology is seldom used outside the nursing profession, and Capers identified four specific patterns of knowing. Empirical, experimental knowledge from scientific inquiry or other external sources that can be empirically verified. Ethical, attitudes and knowledge derived from ethical frameworks, including awareness of moral questions and choices. Personal, knowledge and attitudes derived from personal self-understanding. Personal knowledge is involved in the knowing, with knowing, encountering, actualizing of the concrete individual self. An aesthetic knowledge derived from an appreciation of the nature and art of nursing. An aesthetic experience involves the immediate creation and or appreciation of the situation. This involves empathetic knowledge, including imagining oneself in the patient's position and creative creativity in the response. It can also be seen the classification arose as reaction against empirically derived knowledge and scientific nursing by emphasizing that more personal attitudes and two aspects of knowledge were also important to consider. This certainly appears reasonable in terms of explaining personal human experience, but let us explore the justifications for the typology divisions further.
empiric knowledge is straightforward. Empirical knowledge and empirically knowing and realism. Empirical knowledge is straightforward to understand is also forms the basis of traditional scientific realist argument. Modern ideas of empiric knowledge developed in the early to mid 17th century as a response to the rationalism espoused by Rene Descartes and Benedictus uh, Spinoza. While the rationalists held that knowledge was attained through operations of the mind, empiricists such as Bacon, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume argued that all knowledge was in fact based on experience and was attained through human perception of the world and phenomena arising within it through sensory experience. These were notions originally considered by ancient Sumerian Mesopotamian peoples and classical Greeks and by Leonardo da Vinci and still later by Isaac Newton. Empiricism is based on the principle that we know things because we have experience of them and can verify them to be true through such experience. These are not anti diluvian arguments and remain contemporary and in many ways just as controversial today. As we explored earlier, philosophers in the 20th and 21st centuries have vigorously debated the empiricist argument. The key difference between rationalists and empiricist positions is how we gain knowledge. Rationalists hold that some propositions are knowable by us and by intuition alone, and others are knowable by being deduced from intuitive propositions known as intuitive, intuition deduction thesis. Chomsky, Deleuze, and uh, Gattari have all argued that empiricism is a dogma that leads to a separation of mind and body and that this is unacceptable and one cannot understand the mind through simple human biology. On the other hand, Bertrand Russell and even Dawkins have both been protagonists of a more contemporary rationalism based on observable evidence. Russell argues that the mind has two faculties, cognitive and affective. The cognitive faculty entails intelligence, and the affective faculty denotes our instinctive part or various feelings, cravings, impulses, motives, and desires. Russell was of the opinion that the instinctive part gives us our goals and intelligence supplies the means to achieve those goals. The post-positivist empirical perspective is that much more is observable and calculable today than in the past, but that cognitive and affective processes underpin the generation of empirical knowledge. Modern empirical knowledge is seen as based on rationalism, but not consequent from it, as knowledge generation is seen as a being best derived from experience. Ethical, personal, aesthetic, knowing, and rationalism. Carper's other three forms of knowing identified above all resort to traditional rationalism that involves subjective and creative interpretation and anomalous perspective. This presents us with some logical difficulties as the problem arises. While arguably these are all forms of knowledge generation, they cannot be distinctly separated so easily, and all of them require us to accept some form of relativistic thinking. This does not mean that they are valid forms of knowledge, but it does lead to some problems when we, this does not mean that they are not valid forms of knowledge, but it does lead to some problems when we attempt to use the framework to support practical health interventions. Ethical knowledge, for example, requires to make judgment on what is right or wrong. We know that notions of morality and ethics vary within cultures and that science has very little to say about what is right or wrong. We all possess knowledge of what we consider right or wrong, but this really comes from a range of complex social, cultural, and personal beliefs. For example, in North America and the UK, most society considers female circumcision or the idea of exhuming dead relatives for a family celebration morally wrong, and this is reflected in the social and legal frameworks. However, in African cultures such as Nigeria and Madagascar, such things are culturally acceptable, hence ethical knowledge relies on diverse moral frameworks and thus can be regarded as a relative form of knowledge. Same goes for personal knowledge. This is knowledge of a self from personal self-experience. I may have personal experience of my own thought and behavior, such as how I react to stress, stress or even how my own personal phys, uh, physiology, uh, physiology uh, such as how I react to certain foods. I may also have personal experience of things that are not quantifiable or are not experienced by others. I might feel the spiritual significance of an event such as uh, some form of mess, message from my ancestors or from a personal deity, for example. Or if no one else experiences this or feels that way, then this is my individual experience and again is relative to everyone else's experience of the world. Personal self-knowledge is largely subjective by its very nature. It works on an explanation of the self-perception of, of the individual. And so for explaining why we feel as we do and how we relate to things and to others, inner subjectivity 
it has value particularly for social interaction, particularly important in nursing. It can be argued that a person becomes more self-aware and develops personal knowledge through intersubjective events, and it can help provide inductive insights. However, for every day practical issues, personal knowing is limited in terms of being able to explain other shared experiences or phenomenon as we cannot verify our personal knowing is the same as anyone else without resorting to other methods to acquire knowledge. Uh, the extreme form of this position, solipsism, is to consider that all knowledge is processed by the human mind. It is also possible that only one's mind actually exists. Overall, personal knowing may be useful, but has serious practical deficiencies, as we know, that the human mind can be easily deceived or erroneous, so we must treat personal knowledge with caution. This would also seem to apply to aesthetic knowledge. Knowledge of the intimate or empathetic knowing is based on intuitive or abductive reasoning processes, which we know are flawed processes is a fact preserving rationale, so are therefore practically limited for any form of general application. Abductive reasoning was first described by Charles Sanders Peirce as a retroductive inference and is a, really a form of educational guessing. That's Pierce in 1878. For example, if we know we need to change a patient's dressing in the morning, we generally estimate how long it will take us for it to set up the materials, remove, clean, and replace the dressing based on prior experience or trial and error guesswork rather than deductive reasoning. It is really reasoning to the best explanation, and this pattern matching process is one of the ways that intuitive cognitive processes work. Another problematic aspect of Kaper's aesthetic knowledge is that of empathy. This is hugely challenging for health professionals as we are not our patients, and so trying to put ourselves in their position would seem very unwise, and this will reflect what we think we would feel if we were our patients rather than what they actually feel. Finally, another problem arises in separating aesthetic knowledge from personal knowing. There does not seem to be good rationale to separate knowledge of self and aesthetic knowledge apart from the temporal elements of immediate appreciation, and they seem inextricably intertwined. Overall, the separation of aesthetic knowledge from personal knowledge seems particularly difficult to achieve, and this type of knowing is also highly personal. We have to consider the practical value, value of using these categories to differentiate different forms of knowledge and make decisions based on them. All things considered, all of these last three categories seem to represent relativistic and personal ways of knowing that are difficult to justify action upon without resorting to faith-based argument. Peaks of Carper's typology. There have been some limited critique of Carper's work in the Nursing Academy, but few have really challenged the anomalous foundations of this approach, and more often the framework has been positively endorsed in nursing literature. White, 1995, acknowledged the work has been received somewhat uncritically in suggesting the addition of a fifth pattern in socio-political knowing to expand the framework to take into account the social, culture, and political aspects. Nevertheless, she supported the framework as a conceptual organization for nursing promoted its expansion. Silva, also, 1995 took a different approach that suggested a philosophical shift towards an even more ontological focused framework using artistic examples. They argue uh, Carper's way of knowing were too limited and the categories appear mutually exclusive and epistemologically focused. They suggested that the approach should move further into the realms of ontological reflection on reality, meaning and being to foster a better integration of art and science. For 2001, we're all was also generally supportive of Carper's work, but acknowledged the ineffability of aesthetic, personal, and ethical patterns of knowing, and their eclipsed by empiricists in the development of EBP. However, they supported the introduction of wider forms of knowledge into EBT, incorporating all patterns of knowledge. Porter, 2010, also acknowledged some of the issues with the inability of aesthetic knowledge to provide transparency in its expression, and that such patterns of knowing may not be amenable to empirical justification and therefore public scrutiny. Porter's view was generally supportive and she concluded that the new problem of EB, EBP requires nurses to change shape and patterns of knowing to respond to the challenges it represents. Okay, so here we see kind of the multiple truth hypothesis, a, multiplicity, a multiplicity of alternate ways of knowing. On the basis of using a rationalist and relativistic arguments for knowledge generation to define categories of understanding, we must logically be open to alternative typologies. If we wish to adopt Carper's classification, then we also have to support consideration of other categories of knowing that can be argued as ways in which people know things. Our point here is that postmodern 
and nominalist arguments used to support Carper's classification can be equally well used to underpin other creative classifications in response to this proposal and to illustrate the arbitrariness and cultural specificity of any attempt to categorize the world, we have to develop such an alternate classification below. A version of this argument was originally made by the writer George Louis Borges in his 1942 essay, The Analytical Language of John Wilkins. Wilkins was a 17th century philosopher who had proposed a linguistic classification of the animal kingdom that would encode a description of the thing in the word naming the animal. In response to the scheme, Borges de uh, described a curious though logical alternative typology based upon a fictitious Chinese encyclopedia, the Chinese celestial emporium of benevolent knowledge. So in the spirit of Borea's typology, we present an alternative comprehensive typology as a way of knowing. Empirical knowledge. Knowledge derived from empirical sources, experimental knowledge may be derived from scientific inquiry or other external sources that can be empirically verified. Hallowed knowing. Knowledge revealed in ancient sacred texts this form of hermeneutic knowledge is obtained from the reading and interpretation of sacred texts. Esoteric knowledge, knowledge of things beyond comprehension. Esoteric knowing is a personal knowledge that cannot be explained to others in a meaningful way, but is understood to be true by the individual. Knowing knowing. This is knowledge surrounding the processes involved with coming to know things curio curiously, a not uncommon phrase in the world of education. Visionary knowing. Knowledge derived from visionary dreaming, this form of no knowing requires the knowledge to have been obtained while asleep. In uh, loonful knowing, knowledge derived from states of madness describes the knowledge to have been acquired by intuitive revelation during an episode of par par paroxysm. Supernatural knowledge, knowledge derived from magic. Here the knowledge has been obtained through the practice of magic or through other uncanny phenomenon. Lupine knowledge, knowledge derived from werewolves. This form of knowing occurs when knowledge has been directly passed on to the individual from a lycanthrope, satellite knowledge, knowledge of things that has arisen at great length, at great height, where the people below look like flies, and lastly, other knowledge, knowing ways not categorized by the above. So uh, although this categorization may appear rather absurd, the arguments we use to support these categories as valid divisions to explain forms of knowing are essentially the same as those supporting Harper's classification, as a result, taking anomalous approach to categorizing knowledge in this way forces us to accept such multiple ways of knowing. The practical outcome of this is that we may generate a multitude of different descriptions of the same phenomenon rather than actually developing useful knowledge. In essence, differing, differentiating between what one accepts as valid from knowledge generation becomes rather an arbitrary point. So practical alternative typology of knowledge from our post-positive and non-realist perspective, however, we can suggest the principle that knowledge is constructed in the human mind based on shared objective reality that includes both individual and subjective components before we consider a framework to account for knowledge on this basis. It is useful to briefly review the notions of priori and a posteriori knowledge. The term a priori prior to and a posteriori posteriori to have long been used to distinguish types of knowledge, justification, arguments. The first used recorded being that of Thomas Aquinas and the Summa Theologica in 1274. There are many points of view on these two types of assertions and their nature and relationship is one of the oldest problems of modern philosophy. This problem relates to the conception of a distinction between analytic and synthetic statements of knowledge arising from the works of Immanuel Kant, David Hume, Bertrand Russell, and the later logical positivist. The distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions was first introduced by Kant Put simply, synthetic propositions can be considered statements that require reference to the world to demonstrate they are truthful. For example, all ill people have infection, and analytical statements are those that refer to statements that can be seen to be true in themselves. For example, all ill people are unwell. A posterior knowledge is relatively straightforward to understand and that refers to knowledge or justifications that is dependent on experience or empirical evidence. For example, some swans are black. This is consistent with the notion of synthetic statements of knowledge. A priori is sometimes used as a term to describe an argument made without a logical basis, that is, without evidence or analysis. More usually, a priori knowledge is considered knowledge independent of experience. For example, all swans are birds. A priori knowledge was presented by rationalists as analytical knowledge 
in that it was independent of experience and that the predicate was implicit in the subject, such as all men are human. However, problems arise in considering a priori as distinct form of knowledge. The logical paradox that humankind identified was how is a priori knowledge possible without some form of experience? Hume argued that nothing could be known about the a priori relationship between cause and effect, and hence many analytical statements were actually synthetic. Also in many propositions, no analysis of the predicates will expose the subject. His notable illustration was the mathematical statement seven plus five equals 12. In themselves, neither seven nor five contain the idea of 12, and they must be combined first. Kant, whose thought derived from the rationalist origins, outlined a distinctive view of a priori knowledge that he expressed in the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781. Bertrand Russell gives him credit for having first conceived of a form of a priori knowledge that was not purely analytic. Kant proposed that we could only know particular facts about the world via our sensory experience, but in the form of such experience depends upon a priori reasoning that paradoxically is a mental construction. His view on a priori was that it described the underlying mental processes prior to experience. For example, he saw time and space as a priori constructs created by the mind prior to experience. For Kant, the physical object is considered unknowable. What we can know is the phenomenon, in other words, the object of our experience, the phenomenon is seen as a product of both itself and us. Thus, as it comes into our experience, the phenomenon acquires a characteristic that can form to a priori knowledge, and therefore this knowledge can not be valid outside our experience. Interpretations of these arguments and views on Kant's ideas of a priori knowledge have occupied philosophers for the last 200 years. However, this form of interpretation of the world involves special abilities that have yet to be described in terms that do not resort to the metaphysical. Kant was argued to be anomalous, and he also supported the priority of mind over matter of physical experiences. His ideas continue to influence much postmodern thinking in nursing today. Nevertheless, most pragmatic and unusable interpretations of a priori knowledge that we adopt here is that presented by Quine, who suggests the notion of analytical knowledge is true by virtue of meanings and independent of the effect. In other words, we may consider a priori knowledge as analytical or synthetic, and a priori synthetic propositions are considered true by virtue of their meaning regarding currently accepted facts about the world. Taking such an approach, we consider the following as a simple practical post-positivist classification of ways knowing that avoids resorting to anomalism. Empirical knowledge, a priori knowledge derived from experience, and intellectual knowledge, a priori knowledge derived from form. You know, individual cognitive processes and group social cultural processes. This classification offers advantages in simplicity and that it supports the principle that knowledge has both individual and subjective components that may arise from personal beliefs as a part of social cultural relationships. It acknowledges both the a priori and a posterior aspects of knowing and also provides a practical working framework for the application of knowledge within the paradigm of evidence-based practice, EPT. Conclusions. Ultimately, adopting Carper's typology for practical decision-making is a value laden as any other approach. The adoption of personal belief-based outcome is central to using Carper's way of knowing as an explanatory framework, and this seems overly reliant on all false white intellectual argument in its justification of forms of knowing rather than validation through applied outcomes. Worryingly, its roots in postmodern American neopragmatism suggest that potentially one can justify just about any form of knowledge to support a desired outcome. Ultimately, Carper's typology seems to offer limited practical value in supporting health decisions, as it could be equally well supplanted by any other typology. Arguing that the way that nurses generate knowledge is somehow fundamentally different from the way other people know things seems questionable at the very least. Nursing knowledge would seem better defined by domain and theoretical basis rather than terms of subculture of its members and their shared cognitive processes. Carper's typology was a creative and innovative approach in its time, but 40 years later it appears to have had minimal impact on nursing decision-making practices or health outcomes in the workplace. So perhaps it is now time to seek more functional alternatives that are more commensurate with evidence-based practice rather than ontological-centered anomalous frameworks. Regrettably, if nursing academics continue to champion these perspectives, we may be left with one-way ticket to an intellectual dead end within which any form of nursing knowledge can be justified as simply another way of knowing. We should be reminded that the primary purpose of nursing theory is to support practical outcomes 
focused care rather than to develop even more theory. Given the current demographic trends and growing inadequacy of healthcare resources to meet the demands returning to a scientific pragmatic view that is empirically outcome focused would seem timely. So this article ends up uh, denouncing uh, Carper. However, you know, Duvid's multiple truth hypothesis is probably more in line with uh, Carper. So I just thought I'd throw that in there and at least the scientific background to understand these ideas um, you know, was very good. And that scientific background um, you know, was largely uh, comparable to uh, the scientific background for um, the multiple truth hypothesis. So of that, I've given you largely the philosophical, scientific, philosophy, science of philosophy, I mean, philosophy of science background to the multiple truth hypothesis. I have uh, sent the link to Jennifer. I'm not sure if she's watching or going to be able to hop on, but she's invited. And, uh, you know, for people who are watching, probably noticed, um, you know, hoping that people noticed was that, uh, um, this sounds a lot like cognitive dissonance. Um, you know, this this uh, idea here that uh, we're talking about of uh, um, these processes of mul multiple theories are figuring out the truth and saying that humans per force have to go through this process of deciphering the truth. And, and you know, just by nature of uh, living in a complicated world and basing our decisions um, on our best possible knowledge of uh, what's going on, that uh, we have to do it based on uh, the best knowledge that we could come up with and what's the source of that best knowledge. And so say the philosophy of science in terms of empiricism and all these various things is questionable. What we call science is actually pointing to truth. And then we talk like scientific realism where we're extrapolating from science about the material realm into social structures. And so the multiple truth hypothesis could work like Chamberlain purely for deciphering between or, or amalgamating multiple scientific theories within an empirical approach. Although Duvid is not designing the multiple truth hypothesis to purely um, satisfy that one case of scientific theories, but is it going to apply it to all phenomena and all truth, similar to Carper's where you would have, you know, nursing and where she includes things like scripture and esotericism, and these things would have a value uh, towards the creation of uh, truth. So thank God, uh, looks like we got uh, Jennifer here before we move into uh, um, cognitive dissonance theory. So uh, welcome, Jennifer. Have you been listening? Hey, David. Yeah, I've been doing some work here, so I've been uh, dropping in and out, but uh, it, there's definitely some interesting things that you got to that I was uh, I wanted to mention, if that's okay. Yeah, you know, it was about two hours of reading, and just for you know, people who, who uh, are tuning in now before Jennifer gives her overview, I'll kind of just give a quick overview of the first two hours. I'm giving an overview of my multiple truth hypothesis, so first I, I wanted the philosophical precursors within the Western canon, a largely empiricism and rationalism. Uh, then I had this 1890 article, which I read completely, this Chamberlain geologist that has his theory of multiple working hypothesis, as opposed to you know, having one dominant theory and using that as the paradigm to understand knowledge, to have all these multiple possible theories working at the same time um, in, in purely the scientific realm of a question how the scientific theory uh, should be manifested. I looked at this, uh, I, I showed this long uh, doctorate of philosophy on you know most modern uh, explanation of these various schools of the philosophy of science, including scientific realism. And uh, I looked at the computer programming, kind of like, uh, you know, what if you could program a computer and what, what we call truth discovery, which uh, you know takes Chamberlain's theory to a further extent where um, let's try to give a value to these various levels of truth and say, yeah, there's probably all these various multiple things working at the same time. Um, but from a computer perspective, 
uh, where you're, you know, and there they were looking at uh, um, incoming information where you have constantly new evolving information, like predicting the weather or something like that, um, that uh, would try to mathematize this truth discovery thing. So that's like an application um, to what I'm talking about in terms of making it scientific and quantitative that uh, computer technology is currently doing. I'm going to be discussing more in a future stream. And then I read this thing on nursing with this Carper's kind of theory of uh, using multiple truths for holistic nursing, where uh, you're saying that you can't just use evidence-based practice for nursing. You have to take other things into consideration. And this article it you know, gives the philosophical background to scientific re realism and nominalism. And, you know, I'm just about to hand it back to Jennifer, but I was saying from a, you know, really basic, uh, you say, you know, Jennifer is probably more falling into the school of scientific realism and Duvid more into uh, nominalism. But for this approach that Duvid would apply to, uh, and probably Jennifer also, and that, that the search for truth isn't just going to include empirical um, testable data that we could do about the material realm, but we'll also include other things, possibly like scripture or uh, different sources of knowledge. And then, you know, through what I was talking about, the true function of uh, artificial intelligence, somehow the multiple truth function would accommodate for all of these truths and try to ascribe uh, value. So as I... Um, hand it back to Jennifer. Let me just show this equation one more time. Um, so uh, it's awesome, Jennifer, that BitChute shared uh, me and No More News officially on their channel as a recommended programming to promote BitChute. Um, awesome. But, Congratulations. Yeah. Um, so I, I tried to give somewhat of a mathematical form here, kind of like the integral of kind of like the potential of all sets that are part of the set of all potential sets times the probability of that actually occurring in the uh, material realm or, or being the correct prediction of the material realm equaling one as some sort of like greater formation of the multiple truth hypothesis where you're gonna have all these various theories from the infinite set of theories and the utility of these various theories in the ultimate description of the real truth, the summation of all of those will equal one. And so that's kind of a, you know, the most simplistic form uh, that I could give in a single expression of the multiple truth hypothesis. But after reading all of this, you know, obviously me and Jennifer have been talking over a year now of, about this, uh, but uh, you know, may be hearing me reading some of these other things, uh, you know, word for word, the 1890 paper from Chamberlain and this Carper's theory of nursing and some of the scientific background of scientific realism versus nominalism. Um, do you think you have a better feel for the multiple truth hypothesis? Uh, yeah, I think so. It was interesting to see uh, that it has a precedent and how that, that precedent was expressed. I was a little bit um, disappointed with some of the writing because uh, they don't really give definitions for a lot of these terms. And then they, they use them in reference to their own theories when it's unclear what they mean. You know, these abstract words like truth and reality and, and things like that, like they're just sort of asserted with no explanation. And uh, maybe that's going to be an issue at some point. So another thing was... Uh, a quote that you said that was one of the people making theories said that nothing was universal except names. And that reminded me of what you said about how in your reasoning process, you wanted to look at the set of all possible axioms first, a sort of interesting parallel there. And he, you're, you're using the word axioms where he's using the word names. So, uh, yeah, I was thinking I about that. I mean, it, it could be the set of all possible axioms. It would really just be the set of everything, the set of all possibilities, period, not just axioms. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure. And, you know, moving forward, I'll have to think about that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'll probably determine that more from looking at the truth discovery method of artificial intelligence now, because that's largely already mathematized a version of doing almost the exact same thing that the multiple truth hypothesis is intending to do. 
Yeah, and I think if you want your theory to be successful, it's a good idea to give explicit definitions for all the terms that you're going to reference, no matter how self-evident they may seem, because the self-evident terms like time, space, truth, knowledge, they always are the tricky ones, because we all kind of think we know what we're referring to when we say words like that, but then when you get down to the very basics of it, it's actually quite difficult to give a precise definition. And I thought it might be worth at some point, maybe not today, but we could go through the pramanas, which are the historically traditional standard methods of uh, acceptance of, of uh, knowledge, or sorry, ex proof and demonstration of knowledge. So you were talking about one which was imperialism, or sorry, empiricism. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, empiricism is one of the pramanas. So there's, I think, maybe seven or eight, depending who's counting. And uh, I thought that would be fun to go over because the first one is uh, basically whatever you can observe. That's it. So that's, I guess that's the empiricist, the empiricism viewpoint, which is called the Sharvaka school. Yeah, I was largely framing this um, today in the realm of the Western canon. Although, yeah, I mean, Hinduism actually has possibly an even more developed, uh, um, you know, cosmology of this, and, and uh, you know, also a lot of uh, the things like Spinoza uh, likely were taken from Hindu sources. But for the purpose of today, I just decided to work in the um, you know, the west, the Western canon, so to say. And, and to give you know because my my, my I, I, eventually like if I produced a scientific paper, I would uh, um, you have to give an introduction of the ideas similar to my theory leading up to that time, and it's actually you know substantial amount of work to do it, and uh, um, so you know this stream is like a you know precursor just some of the work to you know hopefully might eventually. Um, it'll be the production of a paper or something like that, and uh, and then eventually a book. So, you know, the, these streams are just the start. And so even if it's only for myself, even no one listens or no one gains from this, um, you know, that I'll listen back and have a better view of my theories. And, you know, hopefully, you know, Jennifer and obviously the, the people I deal with regularly that you know, hopefully will be part of, uh, you know, the advancing of these theories and, you know, be the advanced part of the advancing of your theories and people who listen to the program regularly will, uh, you know, appreciate this work or be able to you know, benefit in their intellectual endeavors from it. Thanks. So how were you looking to thread the concept of uh, cognitive dissonance into MTH? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to try to use, um, the multiple truth hypothesis of framework, I don't know, maybe it's too much to say to answer the hard problem of consciousness, but at least to frame and work around it. So the first thing I want to mention was that Chamberlain's structure for working multiple hypotheses is almost an exact parallel of cognitive dissonance theory and saying that the brain naturally does this process of pattern recognizing where there's multiple different patterns available and usually for the sake of teaching we would just say that there's two two different uh, you know options two different patterns and there's substantial reason to uh choose both patterns uh, but choosing one pattern over the other causes dissonance because uh, you know the patterns only pick up on certain parts and miss out on others and you know if the pattern is like for example christianity versus judaism or uh, you know whatever Republican versus Democrat in the terms like it's a paradigm pattern that a person uses to interact with the world that a lot of times there's dissonance you know it's like okay like I'm a Democrat and I'm supporting these protests uh, for George Floyd but I'm not uh, supporting the the op open up protest or something so some general dissonance that affects everybody or or you know, you know racial uh, uh, thing just where patterns that we see on a regular basis don't match our expectations. And, uh, you know, so if you want to jump right in 
to looking at some of the science of dissonance. But basically what I'm going to say is that this multiple truth hypothesis is actually the method that the mind uses the form consciousness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be promoting the cognitive dissonance theory as a working model until I could, uh, you know, have someone say my own model to replace it. The cognitive dissonance theory is the closest model on the market right now to what I want to uh, um, promote uh, for a multiple truth hypothesis. So until multiple truth hypothesis is popular among enough people to understand how I'm looking at it, I'm going to be using the known framework of cognitive dissonance because in many ways it's very similar. Are you going to go with uh, belief or expectation disappointment as the cause of cognitive dissonance? Well, I mean, it's the multiple truth hypothesis, and I just said the the um, Chamberlain's um, theory of multiple working hypothesis. I'm going to go with both of them. I'm going to leave it open and let the evidence um, guide the direction. So, you know, like I'm not going with any major working theory. I mean, the, the theory that I'm working with is the multiple truth hypothesis, but that's really a framework, not a theory. So when I push for it being able to explain certain things that are called esoteric, that's going to be where my um, push is coming in because the multiple truth hypothesis is eventually going to be a dual framework that explains material and um, esoteric personal phenomena. Uh, but from the, in the perspective of personal phenomena, cognitive dissonance is, is like that science because what really motivates a person could only be known through their personal phenomenon. And then at the same time, you could observe their outward behavior, but there's a mismatch between like you could see a person and you could um, intuit what their cognitive dissonance is, but you don't hear the voice in their head and say, well, you can't really know what their cognitive dissonance is because you don't really know what they're thinking and you can't really know what the person's thinking because of, uh, you know, the empirical problem of clearly giving over um, to another person and the language necessary to uh, describe to somebody else what you're thinking. Um, so the best thing that we have to work with right now is actually this cognitive dissonance theory. So that's what I'm going to be working with. Although, you know, in, in terms for solving the hard problem of conscious and no, we're going to need more than the cognitive dissonance theory. Um, but, uh, you know, rather than me start from scratch and try to do a bunch of things, um, just like I read the Chamberlain paper and the, you know, Carper's nursing theory, I'm going to start with uh, Festinger and the advancements in cognitive dissonance. So you're going to go with belief contradiction, which is the Festinger, or you're going to go with, I don't really see how you can go with both because you can't build up a model without I'm, I'm going to I'm going to create my own understanding of cognitive dissonance. And what I'm going to do right now when we're done talking is I'm going to read through papers. I'm going to read Festinger's words himself so you get a feel for what Festinger thought. And I'm going to look at uh, uh, some of the critiques of cognitive dissonance. I'm going to look at um, what's called action-based model of dissonance, which is not Festinger's model, but this is the most accepted current model of cognitive dissonance today, um, which I'm going to explain what this action-based model is. And then I'm going to look at the neural basis of cognitive dissonance. And uh, I also have um, a model of emotions and cognitive dissonance. So we talk about cognitive dissonance just in terms of thought and discernment of truth. And we'll also look at the dissonance of, of uh, when emotions get attached. So what I'm doing here, I'm not promoting cognitive dissonance there in that sense. I'm giving an overview of the best current understandings in the field of science. So I gave the backdrop of the current state of the philosophy of science and where the multiple truth hypothesis fits in with the other thinkers and the progression of thought. So I'm going to do the same thing with cognitive dissonance. I'm going to go the origin of the idea, the development of the idea, the best knowledge of the idea till today. And then within that framework, one thing for my own personal exercise, so I'll be able to best understand, uh, you know, the use of terminology and language and, uh, and uh, to complement work that other people have already done. Uh, but no, I mean, my intent 
is to uh, push these fields uh, to a further extent. And, you know, at some point, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be developing the theory of cognitive dissonance. You know, I'm, hopefully me and you together are going to be developing um, a completely different framework for consciousness and a whole bunch of other things that, you know, will eventually incorporate things like Penrose, Hamrov, and other aspects also. Great. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing the results because I, I have a model on cognitive dissonance and it's different. So I'll make you a diagram to uh, show, explain the differences. I do agree uh, with one aspect of what you're saying that you really can't overstate the importance of axioms. Because axioms basically, they're like the starting point for everything. So it's, it's like basically if you're going on a trip, you know, or you're taking a car, or a jet, a helicopter, a bike, uh, the axioms are, are like the vehicle of the trip. You, you might be going to the same place, but the trip's going to be completely different. And the vehicle you choose will determine what the trip looks like. That's yeah, very important stuff. I mean, in using that example for like scientific publication, you know, like the road and traffic or the police, those are the other theories on the market. You know, like you have to put your theory, you have to do the research at least to be published in terms of you know, uh, your general scientific practices. You have to read the major literature of uh, the various people that are you know, trying to explain and answer the same questions you are as in terms of like uh, Chamberlain's multiple competing hypo hypothesis. Uh, I could sit around and come up with multiple hypotheses that might explain the phenomenon. Um, but from a scientific perspective, you also have to review the other people that have uh, put out, uh, you know, so like like we we're talking about Kostlin and uh, Nowak or whatever, you know, because, uh, you know, like I'm here in Michigan, I'm University of Michigan alumni, and uh, I'm not proposing this plan in synagogue. I'm trying to make these streams and at least the multiple truth hypothesis, the first presentation that would be presentable um, you know, in a university, in a scientific setting, although I would like to present it in all different types of settings. But right now, my main focus is uh, putting it in terms of the, the realms of mainstream science and philosophy. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, that's not my main focus. That's my initial focus, kind of like what you said, like why you learned physics, because that's the, you know, the language of uh, the elite, so to say. So right now, um, um, I wouldn't um, go that far. I would say physics has the most prestige in terms of objective knowledge in the modern day. I wouldn't say the elites speak the language of physics. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean that's it depends what you mean the elites. I mean, that's like the elites probably more speak the language of banking, and most bankers don't know the language of physics. But but I mean in terms of uh, um, really like I want to add things like Kabbalah and Vedic wisdom and other things, and, and one of the larger purposes of the framework of the multiple truth hypothesis is going to be mystical in purpose. However, um, and, and we talk about that in Week in Review all the time, however, the main thrust of the, the streams and the original um, putting forward of the idea I'm going to try to do in um, the most scientific manner and, uh, um, and, and I guess, you know, of all the George Floyd protests and stuff going on, that uh, I'm, I'm going to do it uh, in a way that's largely in accordance with the Western canon, at least in terms of uh, the structuring of scientific ideas, although I think the multiple truth hypothesis is actually going to you know, break down this paradigm of, so to say, structuring it within the Western canon. And uh, you know, actually, Carper talks about that at length um, in terms of uh, Carper's intention of uh, you know, the nursing paradigm of adding these various things. And, uh, you know, saying that you can't objectively divorce, um, you know, like the Western idealism that said, like, we could objectively observe nature. And so, like, no, this is a Westerner's approach to the observation of nature. And there is no such thing as an observation-free, bias-free um, observation. Yeah, good point. And uh, I think, you know, the Western and the Eastern canons both need a little work to sort of be unified to a grand central whole. Uh, I mean, ultimately, East and West is a false dichotomy. It's just one planet with one set of laws, right? So I think one thing, especially this, uh, 
and, and what you just read today really makes that point is that <clears throat> the axioms are simply not defined well enough or the axioms are defined using words that are not defined. So it's just like, okay, we'll take it for granted that knowledge is a thing, but really what is knowledge? Like who can actually give a good definition of knowledge as, as a construct that everybody will agree with? I think it's actually quite uh, challenging to do that because it's just, it's like space and time. It's like you take, the, you take it for granted that knowledge is a thing, but then when you go down to actually ask yourself, well, what is it structurally? You, we kind of know what it is functionally, but structurally, that's a different question. Yeah, so uh, I have five more articles on cognitive dissonance. Um, one of them is long, the one that has the, the probably the most important one, the action-based model of dissonance. So I'm not sure what your schedule is or if you want to stick around or just mute yourself while I, while I read or if you want to uh, sign off or, or if you want to uh, you know, uh, stick around, I'll read and then, and then uh, um, you comment after. How much longer are you thinking of going for? I mean, it could be another hour or two. I mean, I'll, I'll read a paper. I, I have a few papers that will take five, ten minutes to read and then, uh, you know, another one that's going to take at least maybe an hour to read. Oh uh, yeah, it maybe it's matter. better. Maybe it's better if I sign off because I do have quite a bit of work I have to do today. But uh, maybe we could just go over my explanation of cognitive dissonance real quick, if you want to, because I think I think I sent you some uh, images that explain it. I don't have my Facebook up, but, but I mean, uh, I, I guess you're saying you Facebook messaged me. Uh, I sent them to you a while back, but I can resend them, and uh, they're going to be too far back in my them. message to 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 find. Yeah, I can find them and look at them because uh, I thought it would be interesting because, yeah, it's uh, it goes with the quantum mind. And as you know, I have taken great pains to assert axioms for quantum mind. So if you uh, had an opinion about the quality of those axioms, I'd love to hear it. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can pull up the rest of the... The rest of them. I think I've got one. Yeah, here we go. I'll try to get, grab the good ones. Okay, so this was your flow of consciousness one? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at consciousness as a cycle. So what that's, I suppose you could argue that that's an axiom of my system, that basically everything is a cycle. And so beginning and end, those things are what you would call relative because a cycle is something that exists as a, a cogent whole. It has no beginning or end, but we can, we can artificially or synthetically impose a starting point, right? Like for example, human consciousness doesn't have a beginning in the sense of, well, I mean, let's just say for the sake of argument, it's made up of stuff that's always been here in the universe. So it's without beginning, but then we can say, well, we're going to impose an artificial beginning, i.e. the beginning of your life some 40 years ago. Right? So it is possible to impose artificial beginnings and ends, but ultimately everything is being approached as a cycle. And so what I've done here is show a cycle of, I'll just pull the, the image up right now. So basically you start out with normal consciousness and that's just undisturbed. And then you have an observation which causes conflict when this is where the cognitive dissonance is starting. So you have expectation and actualization. So what you expect to happen versus what really happened. And when your subconscious or whatever aspect of your conscious is re responsible for that, if it, recognizes that there is a contradiction between expectation and reality on a particular level, that's what's going to trigger the cognitive dissonance. So we have like, it's like a two step process. The first step is the reduction of the eigenstate, which is this initial observation of something contradictory, uh, contradicting your expectation. And then the judgment about that expectation. And that's where the cognitive dissonance comes in. Oh, and did you? Okay, let's get this other image. That's a basic 
diagram of consciousness as a whole, because for those of you familiar with my theory, we have one consciousness each, and it's a subset of that consciousness that we experience as our subjective consciousness. So if you think of it as a Venn diagram, consciousness would be the outer circle, and then you have a, a, an inner circle, which is a proper subset, <clears throat> excuse me, of the total consciousness, which would constitute the self-consciousness or awareness or however you want to define it, but it's basically what you experience day to day as consciousness. And so we have the, the mind's eye, and then we have this flow of basically expectations, which are spontaneously generated. And what we're picking up on is a contradiction between expectation and reality. And when we do pick up on that, we get the cognitive dissonance. So my cognitive dissonance model basically relies, um, it centers on expectations, whereas this other model that you've been talking about centers on beliefs. So I, I want to look at that a little bit more when well, I get the, the diagram done. Your, your, Pardon? What's the source of your expectations or what's the difference? I would say that you're, what you're calling expectations to diff make that different from beliefs. I mean, why aren't beliefs expectations? Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm making a diagram for it because it's possible that they're not quite the same thing. I think that they are functionally the same, but structurally different. So I'm going to make a little diagram. I'm just halfway through it right now. Well, I'm separating. I'm, I'm just saying, like, just call it patterns. Like, you know, the simplest, uh, you call it what it is. It's a pattern. And if you say a belief or an expectation, that's an extrapolation of uh, the essential thing, what it is. And, and that's a pattern, whether it's a belief or an expectation. Yeah, you may be right. I mean, the way I look at it is... Uh, I really look at the neural really basis like, for this, you know, saying that uh, well, if you're talking about something that has a neural basis, there's neural basis for patterns. There may not be neural basis for beliefs. And uh, you, there may be neural basis for expectations that that would be, you know, so expectations might make more sense in the neurological explanation of dissonance than something like beliefs. Yeah, that's a good point. So I'll, I'll make that, I'll make a note of that. Um, my concern with the word like pattern is it falls into the domain of being too general because there's multiple levels of patterns we could be looking at. Basically, my argument is that the expectation is, is a literal simulation of your mind itself. So your mind does multiple computations. And one of these computations is a simulation of the expected value of your experience. And that simulation is largely subconscious, but we know it must be there because we experience cognitive dissonance. But when I give my definitions, I'll try to work the word pattern into it so that it's easier to unify because there's kind of two levels that we're looking at it on, right? There's the practical side and then there's the like theoretical brevity side. For example, your formula is very short, but it sort of gets all the information hyper condensed into one little formula, which has its utility because math is all about brevity, right? Ideally. And then we'd have to also sort of tease it out so that it's accessible to a wider audience. So I kind of see that as like a two pronged approach that I like to take the really theoretical accuracy, but also it's relatable to a point where people can actually use it and identify with it. And my concern with something like pattern is that it's maybe too general for people to identify with. Yes, I'm, I'm going to, eventually this is going to get you know, into a substantial amount of, of uh, neurology and uh, you know, maybe even you know, quantum mind type things, which, which uh, will require mathematical models to, to map it. And uh, what uh, is probably the most popular field in the science of neurology is what they call chunking. And uh, you know, how, if that relates to, you're saying you want a word to describe what's going on in yourself. Is it a belief? Is it a pattern? Is it uh, an expectation? And you're saying, well, the neurologists say it's a chunk. You know, whatever it is, we know it's some sort of chunking of information where there's some sort of storage. And then it's also a question, what does it mean, storage? Uh, you know, can it, is there a neurological basis of storage or does it take some greater phenomenon to explain that? Um, but whatever the neurological phenomenon say, it's chunking is what we know happens. That, uh, that uh, mo you know, something that would be a singular point of information gets chunked together 
with another piece of information and, and presumably chunking could possibly be infinite. You might be able to chunk infinite amounts of information or you know, chunking would you know, have uh, you know, some limit to, to the ability of, of, of that. But uh, you know, from a neurological basis, you know, where you want to call it belief, expectation or pattern. And then when we're looking uh, what uh, science and the current state of uh, evidence of uh, the physical brain is telling us and also uh, psychological studies for how the uh, that have tried to determine how the mind actually goes about these processes all of them are pointing to this phenomenon that's referred to as chunking yeah quantum chunking it's going to be a bit of an undertaking because we're going to need to look at what mathematical forms will allow for this chunking to be coherent. In other words, your thoughts have to be just like understandable by your mind. So that imposes a certain mathematical restriction upon what formulas, uh, namely relating to the base E, which has derivatives equal to itself by definition. So we can use that equal derivative as a basis, a starting point for the computer itself. And then the chunking is just basically going to be one of the levels of magnification within the total quantum mind, which is going to have to start out with a spherical geometry to go into that mind and find the subset, i.e. the chunk, which is distinguished in the manner we hypothesize that it is distinguished. Yeah, so I'm not going to claim that the multiple truth hypothesis, it's not going to solve... Um, you know, the hard problem of consciousness, but it could provide a framework that didn't exist beforehand that will allow us to, you know, certainly get further in the investigation and, and possibly, uh, um, you know, all ventures of science and understanding knowledge. Well, what we can do is if we can actually get our hands on some of this neurological studies and see what they've come up with, we might actually be able to find which one of our chunking parameters is lines up best with what we observe because well, obviously do one study today but I mean, once we're done talking i'm going to go straight into these studies and uh yeah that's what i'm going to look at awesome well I, I really look forward to exploring this more with you and hopefully next week in review we can go over that list of um possible axioms and talk about what they might mean and uh, i think that'll be a lot of a lot of fun what do you think Except maybe the love axiom, that seems a little lame, but the other ones seemed interesting. Yeah, maybe it, whether looking at the axiom, it really is going to include all possible information that the infinite set of all possible axioms will include everything, or you say that it could be limited and in terms of the multiple truth hypothesis, that it equals one times the probability that that is the correct um explanation of the manifest of the current you know, material reality um, that you know certain axioms could be much more higher in value in, in like a truth discovery but the the, the set uh, of uh, axioms at least from my intuition about uh, the multiple truth I possible will probably be infinite and will include all possible axioms although almost all of those will have a near zero truth discovery value and uh, you know there'll be certain axioms that will have a uh, you know significantly higher truth discovery value but uh, you, you know the the basis of the multiple truth hypothesis is that the truth discovery value of all of them has to equal equal to 1 very interesting well i really look forward to hearing more about this and i'll, I'll be listening into the stream while I'm, while i'm doing my work here today thanks for having me on duvid okay I yeah think there's a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to acknowledge it, but it's been asked a couple times from Red Sweater there. So I just thought I'd bring it to your attention and uh, looking forward to our next chat. Okay. I appreciate it. Maybe like an hour or so if I'm still streaming, you want to come back, uh, just uh, message me. Or I guess it'll be the same link anyways. Awesome. Talk to you soon. Okay. So got the Red Sweater. Do the to multiple truths as end individual truths are they mutually exclusive thereby not contradictory they can be contradictory so i say just because they're contradictory doesn't mean they're mutually exclusive and that's going to be one of the insights of the multiple truth hypothesis as a way to work through paradox so uh, i appreciate your
question. I'm sorry, because when I'm reading the material or had the screen shared, I wasn't uh, looking at the chat. And, uh, you know, you can join my Discord or comment on the video afterwards, because I'm, I'm now I'm doing mostly reading and presenting of information, so it's not that interactive with me corresponding with the chat. But I have to put forward a whole bunch of information to, uh, you know, make, get these ideas out there. So uh, let me pound through and, and start reading some more of these. So let's look at Festinger. I'm not going to read his actual 1957 paper, um, but uh, I'm going to read a later paper by Festinger that, uh, that, you know, goes through the history of the cognitive dissonance theory because, like, the original Festinger theory um, you know, has been worked and changed quite a bit. Okay, so just check, make sure my... Okay, so I'm going to take the earpiece out. So I'm just uh, reading. Okay, cognitive dissonance theory, Fessinger. From Miller, Clark, and Jell, 2015. Cognitive dissonance theory, Fessinger, 1957, posits that individuals seek to maintain consistency among multiple cognitions, thoughts, behaviors, attitudes, values, or beliefs. Inconsistent cognitions produce unpleasant states that motivate individuals to change... <coughs> One or more cognitions to restore consistency with other cognitions. Consonants. Cognitive dissonance was one of many theories based on the principles of cognitive consistency that grew from earlier theories such as balance theory of Heider in 1946. Unique to Festinger's approach was the proposal that cognitive dissonance is an aversive mental state that motivates individuals to reduce the dissonance. Although the original conception of cognitive dissonance theory was intended to apply a broad range of psychological phenomena, so subsequent re research tended to focus on attitudes and behavior. Aronson, uh, 1969, introduced a self-concept theory, which posits the dissonance can be caused by threats to an individual's self-concept. When a person experiences conflicting cognitions, such as I love my wife and I was rude to my wife, he experiences discomfort that threatens his self-concept. This motivates him to change subsequent behaviors to reduce dissonance, like buying flowers by increasing behaviors that affirm attitudes central to the self, like uh, being a good husband, the relative importance of attitude inconsistent behaviors is decreased, thus reducing dissonance. So Steele and Lou, 1983, later suggested that individuals could relieve dissonance induced arousal by simply reaffirming a value aspect of the self, even if the aspect is unrelated to the dissonant cognition. Steele and Lou's experiment demonstrated that typical inductions of dissonance do not cause attitude change if participants are simply given the opportunity to reaffirm central aspects of their self-concept. These interpretations of cognitive dissonance place greater emphasis on the desire to maintain self, positive self-perceptions rather than cognitive consistency. So in contrast, Bem, 1965, offered a non-motivational explanation of dissonance reduction. His self-perception theory stated that one's attitudes are not predetermined, but instead are established by observing one's own behavior and inferring one's underlying attitudes based on those observations. Consequently, by uh, the way one individual infers, his or her own attitude is functionally equivalent to the way an outside observer would infer his or her attitudes. Thus, attitude changes occur through a non-motivational assessment of previous behaviors. Don and Cooper tested the assumption that dissonance is a basic emotion comprised of physiological arousal and causal attributions of the arousal. First, our participants took a placebo pill said to cause tension. Next, participants wrote a counter-attitudinal essay. In previous studies, participants usually reported a shift in attitudes to restore attitude behavior consistency. But Zan and Cooper showed that participants would not report a shift in attitude if they believed the pill caused the tension rather than their counter-attitudinal essays. These findings suggest that individuals must attribute the cause of tension to dissonant cognitions to motivate attitudinal change. Believing the external factor uh, caused arousal precludes dissonance-induced attitudinal change. Another perspective called the New Look Alternative, Cooper and Fazio, 1984, suggests that dissonance occurs when one's counter-attitudinal behavior produces aversive consequences. From this perspective, changing one's attitude to match one's behavior leads to a more positive interpretation of the consequences. Unlike many other dissonance theories, this approach claims that self-esteem and cognitive consistency are less important than perceptions of personal responsibility and consequences of outcomes. 
since Fessinger's original formulation of cognitive dissonance theory. Many theorists have proposed alternatives to dissonance as a basic emotional uh, drive to maintain cognitive consistency. These include desire to maintain positive perceptions of the self, minimizing averse of consequences, and passive inferences about one's attitudes based on behavior. Although there is a disagreement about the nature of cognitive dissonance, it is apparent that many personal and situational factors influence the experience of and reaction to dissonance. It is difficult to determine the underlying mechanics of cognitive dissonance because it is often the case that multiple theories adequately explain the same set of results is therefore unlikely that conclusions about cognitive dissonance will apply across all circumstances. Traditional dissonance studies employed a forced compliance paradigm to arouse dissonance. This technique involves convincing participants to do something that they would not usually do while simultaneously leading participants to believe that they're free, freely chose to exhibit the behavior. For example, students induced to write an essay supporting graduation requirements, they actually oppose can create dissonance between the action of writing the essay and the participant's own belief. Importantly, students in these scenarios must believe that they are freely chose to write the essay. Turning of dissonance technique is called hypocrisy, gained popular in the 1990s. Stone, 1994, theorized that dissonance could result if one gives advice to others and later realize one's own failure to follow the advice. To test this hypothesis, they asked participants in the hypocrisy condition to create a speech to be included in a video ostensibly for an AIDS educational video targeting high school students. Then they asked their participants to list times in their past when they had failed to use condoms, public advocacy of condom use, coupled with the realization that they personally had failed to follow their own advice led participants reduce distance by purchasing condoms. Although forced compliance and hypocrisy studies are among the most noted distance studies, other studies have found variety of techniques to demonstrate the effect of the effects of dissonance on decision making, behavior, attitudes, and morals and learning. For instance, post decisional dissonance can occur when a person uh, when a person is chosen between two equal choices to bolster the belief that one has made the right choice. The person tends to see the alternative more negatively than the chosen one. Other studies demonstrate that strong commitment to a belief that a later invalidate that is later invalidated could lead to an individual to attempt to persuade others to support the incorrect belief, obtaining social consensus that relieves dissonance because the belief and the social support of the belief will be consistent. Initiation studies demonstrate that individuals report enjoying group membership more after enduring a difficult or painful group initiation. <coughs> Increased liking of the group justifies the high price they paid to join the group. Similar deterrence studies demonstrate that children who obeyed a weak order to avoid playing with a toy reported liking the toy less than children who obeyed a strong order. Strong orders suggest external pressures caused avoidance of the toy, but obeying weak orders can motivate rationalization of attitudes, behavioral consistencies. That is, they must have avoided the toy because they do not really like it that much. Just there are many ways in which distance can be induced. There are many ways in which uh, to alleviate dissonance. The first method suggested by Festinger is to change cognitions or behaviors so that cognitions and behaviors are consonant. Participants in traditional force compliance studies tend to exhibit attitude of change after acting in counter attitudinal way by adjusting their attitudes in favor of the counter attitudinal position. Hypocrisy studies demonstrate an effective method to induce behavior change by directing attention to the past behaviors that was inconsistent with change resistant attitudes. Stone, Stone, 1994, found that participants experiencing hypocrisy reduced distance uh, by purchasing condoms and by stating intention to use the condoms. These behaviors strengthen the desirable cognition and take the focus off the undesirable con cognition. The second method of reducing dissonance is to change the environment to bring perceived reality in line with cognitions. For instance, people might select friends based on similar political beliefs if they want to avoid situations that arouse dissonance with regard to political attitudes. The third option for reducing dissonance is to add, add or eliminate cognitions to increase the proportion of consonants, uh, cognitions to dissonant cognition. This effectively reduces the importance of the inconsistency. Rather than reducing the inconsistency itself, such trivialization or delusion is likely to occur in circumstances in which studies are highly salient or central to the individual self-concept and are therefore resilient to change. The hydraulic model of dissonance Reduction suggests that when several modes of distance reduction exist, the easiest mode will be used. Therefore, if changing a central attitude or behavior 
is difficult and easier mode of distance reduction such as trivialization is likely to occur. Distance can also be relieved by other methods such as uh, misattributing the arousal to external elements, creating a positive self-evaluation, receiving ego-enhancing information, reducing the arousal chemically, or by focusing on other valued aspects of the self. Recent work on cognitive dissonance has implored how cognitive dissonance is associated with brain activity. Although the neuroscience of cognitive dissonance is still in its infancy, there is some evidence that distance arousal is associated with activity in the anterior cingulated cortex, which is believed to be associated with processing conflicting information, as is seen when participants read the word blue printed in red ink. Other studies suggest that increased activity in the left prefrontal cortex is associated with attitudinal change followed by dissonance induction task. In addition to studying theoretical aspects of how distance is aroused and relieved, researchers have applied dissonance theory to real-world settings, for example, conditions that arouse Dissonance differ between cultures. For instance, Japanese individuals experience dissonance when behaviors are inconsistent with attitudes only when primed to think about important others, while European Americans tend to experience dissonance regardless of the salience of important others. Studies have also demonstrated that people with high self-esteem experience greater dissonance arousal than people with low self-esteem. The social aspects of cognitive dissonance have also been investigated. For instance, social support can reduce dissonance. People change their attitudes when they witness someone in the group experiencing dissonance, a vicarious dissonance. Researchers in health and prevention have applied cognitive dissonance theory through a variety of behaviors that carry that people carry out despite knowing that their behavior has negative health consequences. For example, recognizing one's dissonant cognitions regarding smoking or body image can lead to reduction in smoking or uh, bulimic behaviors. Cognitive dissonance theory has also been used to study patients suffering from anxiety disorders and depression and who's experienced dissonance as a result of their disorders. Despite extensive evolution, theoretical developments has not progressed without controversy. However, dissonance theory has proved, proved to be uh, resilient and useful in many contexts. Early dissonance theory did not offer clearly defined terms, methods, or operational rules. Skeptical researchers have questioned whether attitudinal changes was the result of a dissonance drive or reinforcement effects of the activity. Dissonance theory also challenged established behaviorist theories by suggesting that cognitive elements should be considered when studying learning and behavior. Uh, finally, methodological techniques gave rise to ethical criticism, especially regarding the use of deception. The theory withstood these controversies and has since gained a general acceptance through decades of experiments, which have largely confirmed its basic uh, proposition Thus, recent research testing basic assumptions of cognitive distance is less common than testing new operalizations and contexts. Okay, so I thought that was a really good uh, overview of cognitive distance theory and the different uh, schools of thought regarding it and the history of it. So, uh, Red Sweater, thanks for sticking with this. And, uh, um, you know, there's a lot to think about in, in, in terms of uh, how these processes work. And I, I was mentioning with Jennifer and kind of like the, the Epstein take is like, what can you really test um, in the current state of ethical, moral, psychological testing versus maybe like, you know, someone got for like Epstein was maybe you know, really testing these theories in a way that, uh, you know, would have been unethical or illegal. So the, the limitations of achieving the truth, so to say, of uh, you know what motivates us and what causes dissonance. And the current scientific method of the possibilities to explain it, you know, these decades and decades of tests that, you know, tried to demonstrate uh, dissonance and resolution and consonance. Okay, so let's look at this article in Frontiers, um, a challenge to human evolution, cognitive dissonance, and... Uh, this is actually an argument against cognitive dissonance, but, but in my mind, cognitive dissonance has such a strong footing that it's actually an argument against evolution. Um, but I'll just read this from uh, Linoid Pulaski, A Challenge to Human Evolution, Cognitive Dissonance, 2013. Cognitive dissonance challenges a possibility of human evolution. A CD is a discomfort caused by holding conflicting elements of knowledge. CD is among the most influential and extensively studied theories in social psychology. It is well known that the discomfort is usually resolved by devaluing and discarding a conflicting piece of knowledge. We discuss it in detail below. It is also known that awareness of uh, cognitive dissonance is not necessary for actions to reduce the conflict. And these actions are often fast and mo momentary. CD is particularly evident 
When a new scientific theory is developed, it takes a while to accept the new knowledge. However, I would like to emphasize that even a mundane element of knowledge to be used, well, it must differ from innate knowledge supplied by evolution or from existing knowledge acquired through experience. Otherwise, the new knowledge would not be needed. For new knowledge to be useful, it must contradict existing knowledge to some extent. Can new knowledge be complementary rather than contradicting? New knowledge does not come from nowhere. Knowledge grows by analogy, by differentiation of previous knowledge, by using what already exists. This is the reason for several empirical laws, the Zimpf's law, the power law, the Pareto laws. All of these laws essentially express equivalent statistical properties of systems in which new entities or usage evolved from pre-existing ones. For example, according to Zipp's law, the frequency of a word is inversely proportional to its statistical rank. This empirical relation is observed in most languages and many other similar systems. This was theoretically proven in the given references. Since new knowledge emerges by modifying previous knowledge, there must always be conflict between the two. Because this conflict between new and previous knowledge, cognitive dissonance theory suggests that new knowledge should be discarded this process of resolving CD by discarding contradictions is usually fast, momentary, and according to CD theory, new knowledge is discarded before its usefulness is established. This is paradoxically a conclusion. This is the paradoxical conclusion of CD theory. To summarize, according to CD theory, knowledge has to be devalued and discarded, uh, but accumulation of knowledge is the hallmark of human evolution. It follows the fact that human evolution Human cultural evolution contradicts this well-established theory. The paradoxical aspect of CD has not received appropriate attention during the 50 years of the development of CD theory. So it's very interesting. You're saying that usually people get new knowledge, and the new knowledge um, um, contradicts the mental image, the mental construct that we have how things work, and therefore we di uh, discard the new knowledge although eventually dissonance could become so much that we change our behavior or discard our old knowledge in favor of new knowledge. Um, but from this, they're saying that that doesn't work with our understanding of cultural uh, evolution. What has made human evolution possible? Emergence of language accelerated the human accumulation of knowledge. A powerful cognitive mechanism must have emerged in parallel with language, which would have enabled holding contradictory cognitions. A hypothesis advanced by Perlovsky suggests that music has been this powerful mechanism that enables us to or our predecessors to maintain contradictory cognitions. Motivations for this hypothesis are as follows. In non-human animals, the vocal tract muscles are controlled from an old emotional center and voluntary control over vocalization is limited. Sounds of animal cries engage the entire psyche rather than concepts and emotions separately. Correspondingly, conceptual and emotional systems, understanding and evaluation in non-human animals are less differentiated than humans. When a monkey is scared by an approaching leopard, it does not think about what to say to the rest of the pack. In fact, animals vocalize only when they are emotionally motivated. Every piece of conceptual knowledge is inextricably connected to the emotional evaluation of a situation and to appropriate behavior satisfying instinctual needs. The emotional and conceptual content is not differentiated as one undivided state. Humans, in contrast, possess a remarkable degree of voluntary control over the voice, which is necessary for spoken language. In addition to old, mostly involuntary control over the vocal tract, humans have conscious voluntary control originating in the cortex. The evolution of language requires this neural rewiring of circuits controlling vocalizations. The human voice partly lost its dependence on uncontrollable emotions. Emotions in humans have separate aid from concepts and from behavior. The gradual differentiation of mental states with a significant degree of voluntary control over each part of emotions, concepts, behavior gradually evolved along with language and brain rewiring. This differentiation destroyed the primordial unity of the psyche. With the evolution of language, human psyche lost its unity. The inborn connectedness of knowledge, emotions, and behavior. The unity of psyche is paramount for concentrating the will and for survival. Those of our progenitors who could not, who could combine the advantages of differentiated language and knowledge with the unity of psyche and the ability to concentrate the will received survival benefit. The above consideration led to the following hypothesis. Well, part of the human voice evolved through language, acquired concrete semantics, and lost some of its emotionality. Another part of the voice evolved into a less concretely semantic but powerful emotional ability towards music, helping to unify the spirit of the split psyche. Of course, these considerations are not proofs. The hypothesis is required experimental verification. 
Um, so review of experimental results. In one classical CD experiment, uh, 1963, children devalued a toy if they were told that they could play, couldn't play with it. This experiment has been reproduced thousands of times with both children and adults in various situations confirming CD theory. The desire to have contradicts the inability to attain. This CD is resolved by discarding the contradiction. Aspen described the prediction uh, the predicament 2,500 years ago. Aesop described the predicament 2,500 years ago. The fox unable to attain the grape devalues the contradictory contra uh, cognition by deciding the grape is sour. However, when the above experiment was reproduced with music playing in the background, the toy was not devalued in 2012. Another experiment reproduced the so-called smart effect of Mozart. Student uh, academic test performance improved after listening to Mozart, although this was later debunked any improved Mint was proven to be short-lived. However, uh, Perlovsky used the Mozart effect 2013 to explore cognitive functions of music. This publication demonstrated that students allocate less time to more difficult and stressful tests as expected from CD theory and with music in the background, students can tolerate stress, allocate more time to stressful tests and improve grades. These experiments tendently confirm the hypothesis that music helps overcome undesirable consequences of CD. It follows that music likely performs a fundamental cognitive function. Music po makes possible the accumulation of knowledge and thereby stimulates human evolution. The origin, power, and evolution of our musical abilities were considered the greatest mystery by uh, Darwin, as well as a topic requiring explanation by Aristotle. Uh, unifying a psyche split by language enabled the accumulation of knowledge and human evolution may all be part of the fundamental cognitive function of music, explaining music's origin and evolution from animal cries to Bach and Lady Gaga. Remaining unknowns and further research. Why have uh, research in CD theory, the most influential extensively studied theory in social psychology, not noticed this contradiction between its fundamental premise and the fact that human evolution this question by itself might be a topic of further research for people that are amusical. Does it mean that they cannot participate in cultural evolution? How do they survive? A preliminary hypothesis is that they participate in cultural evolution by sharing conceptually through languages, cultural benefits, which have been in initially accumulated with the help of musical ability. In principle, this is no different from any everyone sharing technological benefits created by scientists and engineers. Still, this hypothesis requires scientific proofs. This is a wide field of future research. Uh, for example, preliminary data indicate that amusical students have lower grades. Pulaski, 2013, in this general academic uh, deficiency, a consequence of musical deficiency, or are both consequences of more general condition? Is cognitive distance an emotional discomfort? If so, which emotions? Consider this example, a young postdoc receives two offers, one from Stanford, one from Harvard. Each offer by itself would be a source of strong positive emotions but having to make the choice between the two could be stressful. This proves that the emotions of choosing involving CD are different from well-studied basic emotions. How do we measure them? How many different CD emotions exist? Does contradiction between any two cognition elicit different CD emotions? Are CD and musical emotions related? How do we measure musical emotions? How many of them exist? Why during decades of studying emotions have most efforts been concentrated on basic emotions that can be named by words? Does the lack of linguistic terms for an emotion necessarily place the emotion outside the realm of scientific inquiry? Okay, so uh, that one was fascinating. Uh, glad to cover it. Um, appreciate uh, you know at least a few people hanging in. Hope uh, they're learning from this and, and gaining. And, and I feel at least my own knowledge is really uh, increasing. So uh, let's look at this because it's related to the last one. So just this point in evolution, I, I wanted to read it just to, I kind of want to finish up, so I'm not going to give that much commentary, but just kind of put out some of the latest knowledge on uh, cognitive dissonance and where it's going and the connections and you know how it's related to evolution. And generally, I'm not coming from an evolutionary perspective, uh, but cognitive dissonance is uh, possibly the most well-developed social uh, science theory, uh, you know, um, so uh, let's go further in this article about um, a structural model of emotions of cognitive dissonance. Um, I have a year on this, 2012. Okay, this is also Perlovsky with uh, two other authors, the same author as the last one. 
Cognitive dissonance is the stress that comes from holding two conflicting thoughts simultaneously in the mind, usually rising when people are asked to choose between two detrimental or two beneficial options and view the well-established role of emotions and decision-making. Here we investigate whether the conventional structure models used to represent the relationship among basic emotions, such as the circumplex model of effect, can describe the emotions of cognitive dissonance as well. We presented a questionnaire to 34 anonymous participants where each question described a decision to be made among two conflicting motivations and asked the participants to rate uh, anal analogically the pleasantness and the intensity of the experienced emotion. We found that the results were more compatible with the predictions of the circumplex model of basic emotion. So the notion of cognitive dissonance as the unpleasant motivational state that results from the inconsistency between people's behaviors and cognitions were put forward by the Stanford psychologist Leon Festinger about five decades ago. It's first noted Festinger to reduce the dissonance people seek to rationalize their behavior by under overvaluing their choices and undervaluing the rejected alternatives. The recognition that cognitive dissonance plays a key role in people's behavior when choosing between alternatives led to the introduction of the so-called free choice paradigm. Since the selected alternative is unlikely to be perfect and the rejected one is likely to have some desirable properties, making a reversible choice between them leads to the feeling of discomfort associated to cognitive dissonance. Interesting, the literature on the free choice problem is focused exclusively on the post-decision changes in the assessment of the values of the alternatives over valuing our choices, a finding that is closely related to the basic human bias of overestimating what we own the so-called endowment effect. In this contribution, in this contribution, we begin the exploration of a different research vein, namely the characterization, characterization of the emotions people feel the very moment they are prompted to make a decision or to choose between two qualitatively different alternatives. These are the emotions of cognitive dissonance. Of course, the quantitative characterization of emotions, whether associated to cognitive dissonance or not, is itself a major research problem to which there's no consensual solution at the moment. Here we follow Russell's suggestion that whatever a measure of emotion is needed, one should use scales of pleasant displeasure, displeasure, and arousal sleepiness. According, we have presented a questionnaire to containing 10 choice questions to 34 participants and asked them to rate the intensity of the hedonicity, pleasantness of the emotions elicited by the choice. In the second part of the experiment, we asked the participants to write a single emotional word that best describes the nature of the experience, experienced emotion. <laughs> the main drawback of the, our experiment procedure is that by registering the degrees of arousal and pleasantness only, we discard a priori other dimensions that may also be important to characterize the emotions of cognitive dissonance. Nevertheless, even within this limited scenario, we can test whether these emotions can be described by the circumplex model of effect in which emotions are arranged in a circular form with two bipolar dimensions interpreted as a degree of pleasure and a degree of arousal. In that sense, emotions mixed together in a continuous manner like hues around a color circle, a reorientation and consequently reinterpretation of the axis of the circumplex model as positive effect and negative effect has been suggested to correct for the fact that there were few emotions in the neutral middle region of the pleasantness on pleasantness axis. We found that the measure of arousal E and the pleasantness H obtained from the questionnaires are not independent quantities contrary to the prediction of the circumplex model. Most remarkably, however, we found that the X is determined by the direction of the first and second principal components of the matrix of data were in fact associated to actual dimensions of pleasantness and arousal according to the emotional words used by the participants. In addition, the central region of the EH plane where the circumplex model predicts emotions should be absent and fitting a lead described by the word indecision by a majority of the participants. Hence, in the context of the experiment reported, here we conclude that our characterization of the motions of cognitive dissonance is consistent with the predictions of the circumplex model. So here they go on with the method and the plot of uh, their project, of their uh, research. And uh, let me, uh, I'll encourage people to read this, but. Uh, as pointed out, uh, participants described the emotions they felt at making a choice by a single emotion word. They used a total of 77 different emotional words for the 330 choice questions. Um, 
First issue we need to address is whether the participants use the 77 emotional uh, words in a coherent way, whether different participants use the same emotion word to describe their emotions for the same choice question to quantify this expectation. So more, you know, just difficulties of uh, how to uh, quantify this, you know, say like frequency, like indifference, 48, joy, 25, to surprise um, in trying to plot it and uh, then breaking these emotions down into category based on this plot uh, between hedonistancy and arousal, um, which is like a general theory of emotion to connect that to cognitive dissonance. So let me just read the conclusion here. Decision-making in situations of conflicting motivations, cognitive dissonance is a source of emotion, usually described as a feeling of discomfort. It results from holding two conflicting thoughts simultaneously in the mind. These decisions appear to be made in the hedonic dimension of consciousness, the hedonic experiments taking place as an actual or expected reward. In this paper, we made a step towards exploring a new type of emotion, synthetic emotions related to the knowledge of more specifically emotions of cognitive dissonance related to the contradictions between two pieces of knowledge. These emotions could in principle be different from basic emotions, whereas specific words exist to name basic emotions. There are no specific words for most emotions of cognitive dissonance. This fact might be a reason that these emotions have not been systematically studied in the psychological literature. Although the expression cognitive dissonance has been used for a long time, emotions of cognitive dissonance have not been recognized as a special type of emotion, different in principle from basic emotions. By presenting to participants questions as alternative mental choices, our paper presents the first step to address the intricate issue of distinguishing experimentally between aesthetic and basic emotions. On the other hand, it can be argued that there is a fundamental theoretical difference between the basic and aesthetic emotions following Grossberg and Levine. Basic emotions can be considered as feelings and mental states related to neural signs, signals which indicate to various brain regions satisfaction or dissatisfaction of fundamental organism needs, mechanisms measuring these needs we call instincts, hence basic emotions are mostly related to bodily needs, whereas aesthetic emotions are related to the need of knowledge. In addition, Perlovsky, argues that emotions of cognitive dissonance could be in some way similar to musical emotions. On the other hand, the experimental study reported here failed to uncover any distinctions between basic and cognitive dissonance emotions. Rather, we found that the latter can be described remarkably well by the circumplex model, which is a structural model proposed to describe basic emotions. It might well be that our experimental setup centered on the record of the degrees of arousal and pleasantness elicited by the choice question is not sensitive enough for the fine distinctions required to differentiate details of aesthetic emotions. The measurement of the emotions dimension in addition to the arousal and pleasantness may be necessary for achieving that fine distinction if indeed it exists. To conclude, we note that understanding the underlying psychological structures of emotions is germane for the development of robotic systems capable of exhibiting as well as recognizing emotion-like responses. In fact, according to our results and more generally in conformity with the predictions of the circumplex model of effect, the combination of two quantities, the degree of arousal and the degree of pleasantness, can explain a large part of the spectrum of human emotional experience. Hence, the design of artificial neural networks with sensors and estimators for these two quantities may be efficient manner to mimic human-like emotion responses in the machine, the neural network models for decision-making based on positive or negative effect direction, and objects or potential actions can be viewed as examples of work in the research direction. So this is 2012, but uh, you're seeing some semi-newer uh, studies on the direction of uh, you know the science of cognitive dissonance and uh, uh, to a theory of emotion and uh, larger understandings. So... Uh, Let's look at uh, the neural basis of rationalization, cognitive dissonance reduction during decision making. So, uh, yeah, one more paper after this. I've been at this uh, over three hours, so probably it'd be about a four hour stream. Hopefully, wrap it up uh, by 10 o'clock because a lot of information, maybe even earlier. Okay, so. Oh. Looks like I got a computer freeze. Hopefully, hopefully I didn't fall out there. I got a little computer freeze going on. Um,
I hope I'm still connected. So, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't go down there. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. Let me. I'm gonna stop. Uh, Okay, looks like I'm going to have to end the stream. I'm not sure if I'm still ending. I'll have to do these other two papers uh, a different time because uh, um, I have some error. apologize about that. So have a great night and hope to continue this uh, uh, soon. Okay, so I hope I'm still live. If uh, I had some sort of error there, um, I got to check my channel. So I apologize. I had uh, some sort of uh, um, some sort of uh, um, problem there. That uh, so I, w I was looking for my. Okay, let me hope I'm still live. I really apologize about that. My uh, window um, closed out there, so. It looks like I'm still live and I didn't go down, so I apologize. Hopefully, the people watching, and hopefully, this link I had is still there. Yeah, okay. So I actually think I put the link in uh, the the thing. So let me see if I could find this one last uh, link on the action um, basis of thought. If it was uh, chapter three, action. Okay, so okay, so I apologize about that. I'm sorry about the little downtime. There it was a computer error. So let's look at this uh, neural basis of rationalization of uh, cognitive dissonance. And just make sure the sounds working. So I apologize about uh, whatever happened there. Let's see. Okay. Neural basis of rationalization, cognitive dissonance, reduction during decision-making, Jarko Berkman Lieberman, 2011, from the Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience. People rationalize the choices they make when confronted with difficult decisions by claiming they never wanted the option they did not choose. Behavioral studies on cognitive dissonance provides evidence for decision-induced attitude change, but these studies cannot fully uncover the mechanism driving the attitude change because of the pre- and post-decision attitudes are measured rather than the process of change itself. And the first fMRI study to examine the decision phase in a decision-based cognitive dissonance paradigm, we observed the increased activity in the right inferior frontal gyrus, medial frontal parietal regions, and ventral stratum, and decreased activity in the anterior insulin were associated with subsequent decision-related attitude change. These findings suggest the characteristic rationalization process that are associated with decision-making may be engaged very quickly at the moment of the decision without extended deliberation and may involve reprisal like emotion regulation processes. Okay, so decision-making is ubiquitous part of your daily life and people often make decision difficult choices between equally attractive alternatives, yet there is unexpected consequences for making such decisions. After a choice is made between initially matched options, people no longer find the alternative similarly desirable. Rather, people adjust their attitude to support their decision by increasing their preference for the selected option, decreasing their preference for the rejected option or both. This rationalization is thought to be motivated by the drive to reduce cognitive dissonance an aversive psychological state arises when there is a discrepancy between actions and attitudes. In situations when decisions cannot be reversed or when doing so requires great efforts, the discrepancy is often reduced by adjusting attitudes to be in line with decisions. Despite decades of research characterizing decision-related attitude of change, relatively little is known about psychological mechanisms supporting it. Those self-report measures can provide a detailed account of the magnitude and direction of attitude change, they shed less light on the cognitive and neural processes engaged in producing this change. Moreover, attitude change is associated with difficult decisions known as post-decisional attitude change, 
even though most theories of cognitive dissonance are agnostic regarding the temporal course of attitude or change, his name appears to reflect when attitudes are measured in the experimental processes rather than empirically based reference to when processes driving this change are implemented. Nevertheless, the term has been propagated the belief that attitude change is driven by relatively slow reflective cognitive processes engaged well after decisions have been made during post-decision attitudinal assessment, which typically occurs many minutes after decision-making has taken place. In contrast to traditional assumptions about decision-related attitude change, more recent models of cognitive dissonance suggest that psychological distress associated with cognitive dissonance can be begin to be resolved rapidly with attitudinal change processes being engaged as an unintentional byproduct of decision-making itself. These models are supported by evidence from functional MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, studies that demonstrate motor and cognitive conflict, as well as effective districts can be resolved within seconds, often as a function of activity in right inferior frontal gyrus. Given that deciding between equally attractive options by definition provokes conflict and attitude change resolves that conflict, decision-related attitude change might involve reappraisal processes, which are often associated with rapid increases in right um, interior frontal gyrus and decreases in limbic activity. As such, activity in brain regions associated with conflict resolution during decision-making, such as the right IFG, may be associated with decision-making, uh, decision-related attitude changes. In order to investigate brain activity during decision-making and determine whether conflict resolution processes occurring in that moment are associated with attitudinal change, we conducted an experiment with fMRI using a novel scanner compatible paradigm for inducing decision-related cognitive dissonance. Classic studies suggested 27 to 59% of subjects experience decision-related attitude change. Since the goal of the current study was to investigate the neural mechanism specific to decision-related attitude change, an a priori decision was made to limit analysis to individuals who exhibited the phenomenon. Just as neuroimaging studies of placebo response typically exude non-responders from analysis. As a means of isolating specific homogenous mechanisms underlying these individuals, individuals who did not demonstrate significant levels of attitude change were not included in analysis. Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna read uh, the procedure that they give to, to test it. Um, You'll see the results um, revealed the expected pattern of decision-related attitudinal change, replicating the prior pilot study of these methods. Neuroimaging results among uh, the ROIs investigated attitudinal change was positively associated with activity in the right but not left parts uh, triangularis. Whole brain analysis further specified that within parts of the triangularis, attitude change was positively associated with activity in the right IFG along with the medial prefrontal cortex, precaneous, ventral st uh, stratum, and prehippocampal gyrus, bilateral anterior insulin, lateral parietal cortex were the only regions throughout the brain whose activity was negatively correlated with attitudinal change. Or correlates the post-decision attitudinal change. The left column shows clusters of activation identified in group level analysis. So here you have a chart trying to demonstrate the, the region of the brain per, uh, in the table. So these results support recent models of cognitive distance that suggest decision-related attitude change can occur during decision-making as an immediate byproduct of conflict resolution processes. The positive correlation between IFG activity and attitude change coupled with the negative correlation between anterior insulin activity and attitude of change is inconsistent, I mean, consistent with the suggestion that distance reduction may partially be a consequence of IFG downregulation of distress of arousal response in the anterior insula via selection of more decision consistent interpretations to the stimuli. To examine this possibility th further, functional connectivity with anterior insula were assessed as uh, so they went on. Um, But faced with the difficult decisions between equally attractive alternatives, people often adjust their attitudes to support their choice. We demonstrated that processes associated with decision-related attitude change are engaged even when making numerous decisions in quick succession over a relatively short period of time. Using fMRI, we examined the brain activity while difficult decisions were made and observed the great shifts in attitude were associated with increased activity in right IFG medial frontal parietal regions and ventral stratum, and decreased activity in anterior insula. 
Furthermore, analysis revealed that activity in the right IFG was more negatively correlated with activity in the left anterior insula during trials with large compared to small amounts of attitude change. These findings are consistent with newer models of cognitive dissonance, which suggests that cognitive mechanisms supporting attitudinal change can be engaged rapidly without extended deliberation as a byproduct of the decision-making process itself. Plausible mechanism underlying this change in attitudes is suggested by studies of emotional regulation, which demonstrate that selecting more desirable interpretations of threat is associated with a relief from psychological distress, increasing activity in IFG and downregulation of limbic responses. Extending this logic to the current study, conflict or distress uh, produced early in the decision-making process may be relieved by increased activity in the right IFG, which can both facilitate a shift towards decision-consistent attitudes and modulate, modulate activity in the anterior insula, which often accompanies experience of arousal, effective distress or discomfort. In a recent study, a positive relationship was found between activity and anterior insulin attitudinal change in the context of performing counter attitudinal behavior. Situation also thought to elicit cognitive dissonance. This further support the theory uh, that arousal, conflict, or distress set attitudinal change in motion. However, unlike the current study, Van Veen and colleagues did not identify a potential neural mechanism activated during counter attitudinal behavior associated with the resolution of distress that presumably facilitated attitudinal change. This suggests that the conflict aroused during counter attitudinal behavior is that study may have ultimately been resolved by processes engaged at a later point in time, perhaps during reevaluation of attitudes. In contrast, decision making may involve a more rapid deployment of processes aimed at resolution of discomfort or distress generated early in the decision making process, as demonstrated by the inhibitory relationship between the right IFG and the region, such as the anterior insula, associated with the attitude change in the current study. The link between activity in the medial frontal parietal regions and attitudinal change is also consistent with numeral models of cognitive dissonance reduction. Apart from conflict resolution, the most commonly invoked construct of dissonance related attitudinal change is self -re relevance. It has been suggested that conflicts of greater self relevance arouse more dissonance and thus lead to greater attitudinal change. The fact that the medial frontal parietal areas observed here are the regions most commonly activated in the studies of self reflection and self-reference suggests that more self-relevant decisions produce greater attitudinal change in addition to the role in self-referential processes. Medial prefrontal cortex has also been implement, implicated in evaluative processes engaged while imagining positively balanced stimuli as well as generating goals directed at obtaining positive outcomes. Taken together, it seems medial prefrontal cortex may have the capacity to evaluate positive of valence personally relevant stimuli and promote action towards goals directed at obtaining positive outcomes. Activity in ventral striding was also associated with attitude change. The striding plays an important role in processing hedonic information towards reward outcomes and tracks subjective value of those potential outcomes. The relationship between the striatal activity and the attitude change suggests preferences for stimuli are potentially being assessed and updated throughout the decision-making process. Indeed, a study that utilized a similar experiment paradigm described here but focused on brain activity during pre- and post-decision stimulus ratings found striatal activity during initial ratings predicted subsequent selection of items and change in striatal activity during ratings following decisions making was highly correlated with attitude change. Although brain activity during decision-making was not assessed in the study, this data provide further evidence that attitudes are likely adjusted throughout the decision-making process. While the current data are consistent with an emotional regulation account of decision-related attitudinal change, similar inverse relationship between activity, right, IFG, and limbic regions has also been linked with cognitive processes associated with evaluation of stimulus characteristics more generally. For example, effect-based appraisal of stimuli, inhibition or promotion of specific stimuli features during evaluation and appraisal of stimuli as a function of contextual factors are each associated with increased activity in the right IFG and decreased activity in the limbic regions of the brain. Thus, deliberative evaluative processes may also facilitate attitudinal change in the context of the decision-making process. Additional studies are needed to better clarify the role of evaluative processes, conflict and emotive regulations in the context of decision-related attitudinal changes of cognitive dissonance more generally. Although this investigation was not designed to address mechanism of underlying decision-making processes per se, the decision-making literature provides further support for the idea that decision-making processes may in and of themselves promote attitude change. 
for example, when making value-based purchasing decisions, rejecting an attractive item for purchase is associated with increased activity in bilateral insula, whereas accepting such an item for purchase results in decreased activity in the same regions accompanied by increased activity in the IFG. And the current study of striking similar pattern of activity was related to the attitude change associated with making decisions. Likewise, the subjective value of item involved in a purchasing decision is often associated with activity in ventral medial prefrontal cortex as well as ventral stratum um, and activity in these same regions relate to attitudinal change of the current study. Together, these data support the idea that attitudinal change may be a natural byproduct of decision-making processes and may not always require extended deliberative thought to occur. This does not, however, preclude the idea that deliberative processes activated sometime after decision-making may also contribute to attitudinal change but instead allows for the possibility that processes engage much more quickly and without extended deliberation have the capacity to influence attitudes as well. The ability to set resolution processes in motion quickly when faced with effective distress has important implications on resolved effective conflict or distress interfaces with other ongoing cognitive processes, while resolution of this conflict often via top-down inhibition or activity in limbic regions of the brain rapidly restores processes capacity. This may allow cognitive and attentional resources to be directed towards more relevant emotional stimuli in the current context. Additionally, resolving effective distress may also facilitate subsequent decisions promoting behavior. If conflicts or distress is unresolved, future actions towards decision-related targets may be encumbered by recurrent effective distress, eliciting re-engagement of processes directed at attempting to resolve this distress, thus activating processes associated with attitudinal change during decision-making may be an adaptive strategy for both engaging in ongoing cognitive processes beyond a specific decision and allow subsequent behavior towards decision targets to be less effortful. This investigation of cognitive dissonance processes with fMRI provides new insights into the neurocognitive mechanism by which making a difficult choice between equally attractive alternatives can produce attitudinal change, rationalization. These results suggest that processes the driving attitudinal change may be engaged quickly and involve conflict resolution mechanisms associated with coping with effective distress. The fact that neurocognitive processes engage during a few seconds of decision making are associated with attitudinal change suggests that though attitudinal change may appear like this ingenuous rationalizations from the outside, the process driving it may in fact be engaged quite quickly and without the individual's explicit intention. For their gener okay, so uh, there's an interesting, uh, I mean, it's already 10 years old, but a strong overview of uh, the various um, connections in, in research into neuroscience and uh, cognitive dissonance theory as compared to um, truth discovery of the computer method. You know, So um, in the future, as I develop this theory more, we'll be looking much more at uh, truth discovery that the computer uses but we're also going to look at the mechanisms that likely our mind uses. So this is the last uh, report I'm going to read tonight. And this is the action-based model of dissonance. Um, this is a chapter in a book, um, Integration and Expansion of Conceptions of Cognitive Conflict from Harmon Jones, Amodio, uh, and uh, Cindy Harmon Jones. I'm going to skip the part, the overview of the theory of cognitive dissonance experiments, paradigms to use to test the theory, alternative theoretical explanations. Um, but we are going to look at the action-based model of dissonance and uh, some of the tests of it. And uh, I'll, I'll try to at least briefly read through uh, quite a few parts of this, um, you know, because this is a, a full 48 pages. Action-based model of dissonance is presented. The model accepts the original theory's proposal that sufficient cognitive inconsistencies causes the negative effective state of dissonance. It extends the original theory by proposing why cognitive inconsistencies prompt dissonance and dissonance reduction. After reviewing past theoretical and empirical developments on cognitive dissonance theory, we describe the action-based model and present results from behavioral and physiological experiments that have tested predictions derived from this model. In particular, this evidence converges with recent neuroscience evidence in suggesting that the anterior cingulate 
cortex and left prefrontal cortex region are involved in conflict uh, detection and resolution, respectively. We end by reviewing research on individual differences in distance arousal and reduction and present a new measure designed to assess these differences. Okay, so I'm going to cover a lot of this stuff and other ones, but I encourage people to read through some of this. So let me, experimental paradigms used to test distance theory. Three experimental paradigms constitute the majority of tests on distance theory. Each paradigm induces participants to experience an inconsistency between cognitions and then gives them an opportunity to express a change in attitudes. This change in attitudes is measured and is presumed to be a reflect the degree of distance reduction. In this section, we describe the basic logic behind each of these paradigms to provide the reader with a base of evaluating much of the research conducted on distance over the past half century. Free choice. After decision between alternatives, all the cognitions that favor the chosen alternative are constant with the decision, whereas all the cognitions that favor the rejected alternative are dissonant. An individual's experience of dissonance is greater when the number and importance of dissonant cognitions is higher and or when the number of important of importance of cognition, constant cognitions is lower. The distance of an individual experience is typically greater after choosing between alternatives that are closer in attractiveness. Distance caused by a decision can be reduced by viewing the chosen alternative as more attractive and or viewing the rejective alternative as less attractive. The Brem conducted the first free choice experiment. I um, uh, encourage people to read through these experiments on their own. Just trying to finish up here. Induced compliance, dissonance should be aroused when a person acts in a way that is contrary to his or her attitudes because the recent behavior is inconsistent with one's pre-existing attitude, but how can an experimenter unobtrusively induce a research participant to perform such an act? Um, so to explain some of the tests and the effort justification, dissonance is aroused whenever a person engages in unpleasant activity to obtain some desired outcome from the cognition that the activity is unpleasant, it follows that one would not engage in the activity. In other words, the cognition that the activity is unpleasant is dissonant with engaging in the activity. As an individual puts increasing effort into unpleasant activity, the dissonance he or she feels as a result of the activity should increase. Distance can be reduced by changing one's view of the outcome to be even more desirable. See the experiments. So the alternative theor theoretical explanations after these and other dissonance results appeared, some theorists began to question whether the results were due to motivational processes. These theorists suggested that attitude change was due to cold, purely cognitive processes such as self-perception or to managing one's impression to other. However, subsequent research confirmed that dissonance is best characterized as a motivated process. For example, individuals experience the state of dissonance uh, have been found to exhibit heightened electrodermal activity. Uh, and report increased negative effect. After cognitive discrepancy is reduced, attitude change occurs, self-reported negative effect is reduced. Moreover, research uh, using a misattribution paradigm reveals that discrepancy reduction is motivated by the need to reduce negative effect. Thus, the research showing that negative effect occurs as a result of cognitive dissonance and that it creates a motiva motivation to engage in dissonance-reducing activities strongly suggests the dissonance processes is a motivational one. Beginning in the late 1960s, researchers began to propose motivational explanations for dissonance effects that differed from Festinger's originally proposed theory, whereas the original theory focused on a very basic incompatibility between cognitions. These newer theories invoked higher order, more complex processes. They changed the focus from inconsistency to the individual self-concept and the individual's concern with harming others. Self-consistency theory, Aronson, uh, going back 1969, proposed that dissonance only occurs when a person acts in a way that violates self-concept. That is, when a person performs a behavior inconsistent with the view of self because most persons view themselves in a positive light such that they are competent, rational, and moral. Dissonance is experienced when a person behaves in an incompetent, irrational, and immoral way. One of the primary predictions derived from the revision is that high self-esteemed individuals should respond with more dissonance reduction than low self-esteemed individuals because distance experience induced individuals to act in ways discrepant from positive self-view. Studies testing this prediction have produced mixed results. Some showed that high self-esteem individuals show greater attitude change. Some showed that low self-esteem individuals show greater attitude change. And some found no difference between self-esteem groups. 
Therefore, the experience of distance and the engagement of distance reducing activities does not appear to be limited to discrepancy involving the self concept. Self affirmation, alternative to Fessinger's theory, Steele, 1988, proposed that individuals possess a motive to maintain an overall self image of moral and adaptive adequacy. He stated that distance induced attitudinal change occurs because distance th threatens this positive self image, whereas Fessinger's Dissonance theory positive that individuals are motivated to reconcile inconsistent cognitions still propose that instead of individuals are merely motivated to affirm the integrity of the self and maintain a perception of global integrity that is of overall moral and adaptive adequacy. Uh, in support of the ideal, still presented experiments where following a dissonance induction, participants either were or were not presented with opportunity to affirm an important value. When participants were allowed to affirm an important value, distance related attitude change did not occur. However, Simon, 1995, presented evidence supporting alternative explanation for Steele's finding that was in line with the original theory of dissonance. Fessner's original theory proposed the degree of dissonance experience dependent upon the importance of the dissonant and constant cognitions. Simon proposed that the mechanism by which self-affirmation reduced dissonance was by reducing the importance of the cognitions involved in the dissonance. They hypothesized that making an important value salient could reduce distance by reducing the individual's perception of the importance of the dissonant act, even if the value was unrelated to the self-concept. They conducted an experiment in which following the induction of distance, participants were either given the opportunity to affirm an important value, uh, asked to consider a value that's not important to them personally, but was of general importance, or were given no special instructions. Participants in the control condition to change their attitudes to be more consistent with the induced compliance behavior as expected. Participants in both self-affirmation um, and issue salient condition did not change their attitudes. Writing about an important value caused participants to reduce the importance of the behavior and attitude to the point that attitude change did not occur. This occurrence this occurred even when the values were not personally important and thus not self-affirming. Other evidence has been presented that is difficult to interpret in self-affirmation theory terms, such as evidence suggesting that self-affirmation relevant to recent dissonant act increased rather than decreased dissonance-related additional change. Self-models of dissonance also have difficulty explaining the dissonance effects produced in uh, rats, as rats are believed to lack self-conception of morality, rationality, and competence. Recent research has revealed revealed that four-year-old humans and capuchin monkeys who also lack the complex self-concept, um, which would seem to be required for self-models of dissonance, so evidence of dissonance reduction. Hence, although self-aspects appear to moderate dissonance processes, they're not necessary to cause dissonance. In terms of the original theory, self-related cognitions would be expected to affect the magnitude of dissonance as cognitions related to the self are often important to an adult human. In other words, the experimental results derived from the self models are compatible with the original theory. Moreover, uh, the self models are unable to explain basic dissonance motivational effects concerning discrepancies that do not involve the self. Aversive consequences, Cooper Fazio, 1984, proposed that the discomfort experienced in dissonance experience was not due to an inconsistency between the individual's cognitions, but rather to feeling personally responsible for producing an aversive consequence in support of the idea. Um, Cooper replicated uh, Festinger's classic experiment, in which participants were given lower high justification. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to read through all of these developments. I encourage people to read through uh, you know, the various schools of dissonance. Uh, but let's get on to the main purpose of uh, why I'm reading this article. And this is the action-based model of dissonance. Why do dissonance processes occur? Festinger's pause no answer to the question why dissonance processes occur rather than state that inconsistency is motivating. Bram and Cohen and Belvus and Jewell uh, pointed out that a behavioral commitment is an important component of the dissonance process. However, in the previous statements, these theorists did not indicate why cognitions with implications for action motivated persons to engage in discrepancy reductions. The action-based model of cognitive dissonance was proposed to answer this why question, Harmon Jones, 1999. Action-based model concurs with theorizing in other areas of psychology and proposing that perceptions and cognition can serve as action tendencies. Indeed, this perspective on perception and cognition is quite consistent with the situated cognition approach of Smith and Semin, 2004, which proposes, among other things, that mental representations are actions-oriented, that cognition is embodied, and that it draws on our sensomor 
immortal abilities, environments, brains, and bodies, and that cognition and action are the result of dynamic processes of interactions between agents and environment. The action-based model further proposes that dissonance between cognitions evokes the negative effective state because it has the potential to interfere with effective and unconflicted action. In essence, this, uh, scrapping cognitions create a problem for the individual when they those cognitions have conflicting action tendencies. Dissonance reduction by bringing cognitions into line with behavior commitment serves the function of facilitating the execution of effective and unconflicted action. The action-based model proposes both a proximal and distal motivation for the existence of dissonance process. The proximal motive for reducing dissonance is to reduce or eliminate the negative emotion of dissonance. The distal motivation is the need for effective or unconflicted action. This Consistent with socially situated cognitive approach, the action-based model assumes that emotion, cognition, action constitute adaptive regulatory process that ultimately serves survival needs. Past discussions of the theory of cognitive dissonance have referred to two different constructs as cognitive dissonance. One is inconsistency between cognitions. The second is unpleasant emotional motivational state that occurs when a person holds two contradictory conditions. In order to better understand the process of dissonance, the action-based model distinguishes between the two. We refer to inconsistency between cognitions as cognitive discrepancy, whereas we call the unpleasant emotive state dissonance. The unpleasant emotive state of dissonance provides motivation to change one's attitude or engage in other discrepancy reduction processes. After an individual makes a difficult decision, psychological processing should assist with the execution of the decision. The tendency of a participant's in dissonance research to view the chosen alternative more favorably and the rejected alternative more negatively after decision may help the individual to follow through to effectively carry out the actions that follow from the decision. As an example, consider an important effortable behavior decision such as beginning an exercise program. In this situation, the actions implied by the decision are the exercise behavior. The benefits of the exercise from better fitting clothes to improve long-term health constitute constant cognitions. The drawbacks of exercise, including the time commitment and muscle soreness constitute dissonant cognitions. Dissonance effect comes from the conflict aroused by dissonant cognitions and this unpleasant effect motivates the individual to declare, decrease the discrepancy by bringing the cognitions in line with the behavioral commitment. The better an individual is able to reduce the number and importance of dissonant cognitions and increase the number and importance of constant cognitions the more likely it is he or she will faithfully perform the actions required by the exercise program over the long term and reap its benefits. In contrast to the model of cognitive dissonance, uh, that view dissonance processes as irrational and maladaptive. The action-based model views dissonance processes as adaptive. Of course, adaptive functional psychological processes that are useful and beneficial in most circumstances may not be beneficial in all circumstances. Occasionally, dissonance reduction may cause persons to maintain a prolonged commitment to a harmful chosen course of action when it would be better to disengage. However, when we state the dissonance processes are adaptive, we mean that they benefit the organism in the majority of cases. In addition, we must distinguish between dissonance motivation and dissonance reduction. The action-based model, like the original theory, proposed that cognitive discrepancy produces negative effect and that the negative effect motivates the individual to change his or her attitudes. However, it is possible for a person to continue to maintain conflicting attitudes. Furthermore, there are some situations in which individuals do disengage from harmful chosen, chosen courses of action, even though they may experience high levels of negative effect in the process. So now we're seeing a more complete formulation of cognitive dissonance theory in this action-based model. Um, action orientation, spreading of alternatives. According to the action-based model, dissonance post-decisional state is similar to an action-oriented state where the individual is in a mode of getting things done. Once a decision is made, an organism should be motivated, motivationally turned towards enacting the decision and behaving effectively with regard to it. An implemental or action-oriented mindset is one in which plans are made to effectively execute behaviors associated with the decision. We suggest that this implemental or action-oriented state is similar to an approach motivational state. When a person is in an action-oriented state, implementation of decisions is enhanced. We suggest that these action-oriented states and implemental states are similar to Jones and Grad's concept of an unequivocal behavior orientation. We propose the action-oriented state that follows decision-making is equivalent to the state which distance motivate, motivation operates and discrepancy reduction occurs, thus experimentally manipulating the degree of action-oriented experienced 
following a decision should affect the degree of discrepancy reduction in one experiment. Uh, so I'm going to skip the experiments. Correlational evidence also suggests that action oriental oriented processing facilitates discrepancy reduction. So neural activity underlying distance and distance reduction. Action-based model of cognitive distance corresponds closely to recent models of self-regulation developed in the field of cognitive neuroscience, and it provides an important theoretical framework for placing neural processes in the context of motivated cognition. In this section, we have described findings from research on the neural processes associated with the monitoring and response conflicts and the implementation of intended behavior that are consistent with the action-based model. I'm going to skip this. It's similar to the last article I read. But I encourage people to read it if they can. Yeah, induced compliance and relative left frontal cort cortical neural feedback and rel relative left frontal cortical activity and free choice. Action oriented mindset and relative left frontal cortical activation. charts, left prefrontal cortex activity, and approach motivation following prejudice-related discrepancy. Increasing strength of action tendencies and discrepancy reduction. According to the action-based model of dissonance, uh, dissonance should be increased as the salience of action implications of cognitions that are involved in a dissonant relationship are increased. Several theoretical perspectives on emotional emotion consider emotions to involve action tendencies. Brem, to the extent that emotion generates an action tendency, as the intensity of one's current emotion is increased and is involved in a dissonant relationship with other information, dissonance should be increased. Research has demonstrated that the emotion of sympathy empathy increases helping behavior because it invokes altruistic motivation that is motivation uh, to relieve the distress of the person in need of help we conducted uh, so the experiment they conducted so considering the action-based model and other models of dissonance reduction would a change in action oriented and or relative left frontal cortical activity affect discrepancy reduction in other dissonance evoking situations we would expect left frontal uh, cortical activity to affect distance processes when distance is aroused by a strong commitment to behavior, which is what typically occurs in the induced compliance and free choice paradigms. In such situations, we predict that individuals are motivated to follow through with their behavior commitment and to change their attitudes to be consistent with their behavior. However, in some induced compliance situations, individuals may reduce distance by means other then attitude will change perhaps because their commitment is not sufficiently strong or perhaps their original attitude is highly resistant to change. Thus, in other dissonant paradigms, we would predict relative left frontal activation to relate to dissonance reduction to the extent that dissonance is likely reduced uh, via approach motivational processes, such as changing one's attitude to be more supportive of recent behavioral commitment, changing one's cognitions to bring them in alignment with each other is one way of reducing the negative emotion of dissonance. This is the method of reducing dissonance most often measured in research. However, this is not the only way a person can deal with emotive state of dissonance. It is also possible to trivialize the dissonant cognitions or engage in reality escaping behavior such as drinking alcohol, reducing the negative dissonance state and the motivation to engage in discrepancy reduction. Uh, like Duvid, who is just waiting to get high and smoke weed after I finish reading this. The action-based model would predict the re reducing dissonance by means other than attitude change would be more likely when action was not greatly needed or when the action implication of the cognitions were low. It is also possible to experience dissonance and not reduce it. The negative emotion of dissonance provides motivation to change one's cognition, but this motivation may not always lead to such changes. In this situation, the cognitive discrepancy would still be present, but the negative effect would remain elevated. The action-based model predicts that if the individual experienced distance does not reduce it, the effectiveness of his or her behavior related to the commitment would be hampered. This effectiveness of behavior could be hampered by hindering pursuit and acquisition of immediate goal, or it may be hampered in more diffuse ways. These and other ways of dealing with cognitive discrepancies and with the negative emotion of distance need to be considered for future research. The action-based model does not 
make the claim that dissonance reduction always occurs in the direction of a decision. Sometimes a person makes a decision and the evidence is overwhelming that the wrong decisions has been made. This information would arouse dissonance when a person realized that he or she has made a mistake. His original decision is no longer the cognition most resistant to change. Consider Leon who uh, chose to attend one university over another after beginning the first semester. Leon might realize that the university chose is completely unsuitable for him. He will likely not be able to reduce the dissonance associated with the decision. Rather, the negative emotion of dissonance would likely increase. At some point, as dissonant cognitions continue to increase, he may choose to reverse his decision and look for a different university. Fessinger, 1957, reports the results of such an experiment. Like the original theory of dissonance, the action-based model predicts that the direction of attitude will change will be in the direction of the cognition that is most resistant to change. Individual and cultural differences. Recent research has suggested that individuals and cultural differences may moderate dissonant processes. For instance, individuals with greater preferences for consistency show greater attitude of change after being given high choice in an in induced compliance situation. Individuals from Eastern cultures as compared to Western cultures show greater dissonance related attitude of change when interdependence uh, and salient. As noted, uh, Wickham and Bren individual differences in dissonance related attitude change could emerge because the differences in the initial perception of discrepant cognitions, the awareness of dissonance and the tolerance of dissonance and or the mode of dissonance reduction. If attitude change is the only measure in a standard dissonance experiments, examining individual differences, it is impossible to determine why a particular individual difference may be related to a pattern of attitude change. In order to determine why a particular individual or cultural difference relates to a pattern of attitudinal change, it would be necessary to measure the relationship of this difference to factors influencing dissonance. Assuming no difference in the above variables, initial perception of a discrepancy, the action-based model suggests that the, these individuals and cultural differences may be associated with differences in the extent to which unconflicted action would be important. For example, preference for consistency may, may be related to tendencies toward action orientation. In addition, individuals high in preference for consistency may prefer consistency because the implications inconsistency has for behavior, and they may be more concerned about executing effective behavior. With regard to cultural differences, cultures that value or emphasize the group over the individual may cause one to evaluate cognitions, their relevance to each other and to behavior, and their inconsistencies according to group standards rather than individual standards. Alternatively, these cultures may differ in their tendencies towards individual versus groups action uh, orientation. In the following section, we review research conducted in the last two decades on the relationship between individual differences and dissonant processes. We then present data on the new questions designed to measure aspects of dissonance process. We talked about self-esteem. Uh, one individual difference that has received much empirical attention is self-esteem. This is because self-versions of dissonance theory predicted that individuals who differed in self-esteem level would respond differently to dissonance-inducing situations. For example, the self-consistency revision proposed that persons with positive self-concept should respond with more dissonance when they lie or act counter to their values. Uh, because the discrepancy between their positive self-conception and their knowledge of their behavior is greater for them than in persons with negative self-concepts who may not have expected themselves to behave in these ways. In addition, the negative consequence of the decision, uh, which suggests that the person made an unwise decision, are inconsistent with a positive self-concept. An individual of high self-esteem should show greater evidence of discrepancy reduction following a difficult decision. Gibbons, 1997, provide evidence supporting this prediction. In their research, they found that smokers, look at more recently, Jordan, 2003, found support for self-consistency predictions using an approach that separates trait self-esteem into an explicit, more conscious and implicit, less conscious dimension based on the idea. The explicit and implicit self-esteem are independent and that individuals with high explicit but low implicit self-esteem may be particularly defensive, but the uh, they predicted that such individuals would show greater discrepancy reduction than other individuals. In this study, participants made a decision between two moderately positive and similarly rated food entries, and uh, so on. So in direct contrast to predictions derived from self-consistency theory, the self-affirmation model predicts that persons with high self-esteem would be less likely than persons with low self-esteem to engage in discrepancy reduction because persons with high self-esteem have more positive self-concept 
and self-resources for which to affirm and repair their perception of self-integrity. According to the self-consistency model, the actions often solicited in distance experience experiments are more discrepant from positive than from a negative self-concept, and thus individuals with high self-esteem should experience more distance when they engage in these actions. Um, so there's further tested, more recent work testing, self-standards model of distance has found that individuals with low self-esteem, so less attitude change following induced compliance if their personal self-standards were primed uh, immediately after the writings of the counter-attitudinal essay. So very interesting, uh, these things, self-consistency and uh, relation to self-esteem or varieties of self-esteem. Okay, so preference for consistency. Caledini developed a measure they referred to as preference for consistency. Um, action orientation, other evidence like that the individual differences in action orientations relates to discrepancy reduction. As reviewed previously, students uh, searching for apartments who were dispositionally high in action oriented orientation increased the attractiveness rating of their decisions more than individuals who are disposi dispositionally low on action orientation. Cultural differences, caustic concerns about individual differences uh, research. So let me see if there's conclusions here. Some charts of this, some mathematize it, some of these questions. Okay. Action-based model assumes that distance process is the conclusion of uh, this paper. And assume the conclusion of my stream. Thanks, uh, Jennifer, for still being here. Um, if you want to uh, join back in, if you still have the link, uh, feel free, because uh, I'm about to conclude. The action-based model assumes that distance processes operate because they are functional. That is most often useful for the organism. However, the action-based model does not claim that distance reduction is always functional. We think a distance process is being similar to other functional motivated behaviors such as eating. Eating is necessary for the survival of the organism. However, disorder eating can be harmful. Similar distance reduction often benefits persons by assisting them in acting on their decisions without being hampered by excess regret or conflict. However, a person makes a poor decision and then reduces the distance associated with the decision, he or she will persist in acting on the decision when it might be advantageous to disengage. Action-based uh, model proposes that distance reduction will not always functional, is functional more often than not. In the majority of cases, it is advantageous for a person to reduce distance and act effectively on their decisions. The distance reduction mechanism functions to override continuous psychological conflict and would potentially interfere with effective action. We suggest that action-based model provides an explanation of the underlying basic motivations behind distance processes. The action-based model assumes that in most cases, distance processes are behaviorally adaptive. Distance reduction primarily functions to facilitate effective action. The reason organisms experience discomfort when they hold conflicting cognitions is because conflicting cognitions impede effective action. We hope that this new way of thinking about distance processes will stimulate research on distance theory and assist on connecting the large body of distance theory evidence with other research literatures concerning action orientation, behavioral regulation, emotional regulation, and neural processes that underlie these important psychological processes. So uh, there you have it, folks. Uh, um, a lot of information. Uh, let me re-enter screen share here and uh, see if uh, you may... Jennifer has any interest in coming on for concluding remarks. So I'm just going to show you know, multiple truth. I still have um, a lot of stuff on physics and the holographic universe, most, uh, mostly on uh, physics and the multiverse, and then on uh, quantum consciousness, holographic consciousness um, that I'm going to continue on in this uh, sense. So this is the first of my programming on the multiple truth hypothesis. Appreciate uh, Jennifer, uh, um, Church of Entropy, my co-conspirator in these theories, helping me uh, articulate and uh, providing me a platform to discuss this now for over a year. So uh, I'm glad I finally got some of this information out there and hope uh, 
to release more. So today we went over some of the basic philosophical background of uh, you know just empiricism and rationalism and uh, the philosophy of science uh, to show uh, you know where Duva's multiple truth hypothesis fits in. I showed two papers that had similar ideas to it. Uh, this uh, um, Chamberlain, 1890 geologist on the working multiple hypothesis and uh, Carper's uh, theory of nursing that also had a, a great uh, you know, philosophical analysis of the different schools of, like nominalism and scientific realism. That long uh, dissertation uh, for the doctoral on the scientific realism in relation to international relations, but seeing how, uh, you know, what, what can really science tell about uh, more than just the description of the material reality and the differences and how the philosophy of science uh, looks at, uh, you know, the value of truth. And I showed one paper on computer science and the direction of artificial intelligence in determining truth value from kind of like a multiple working hypothesis of how do you take all this different conflicting information and determine truth. And then Jennifer came on and gave a few models of uh, you know her thoughts on what I said and then some of her uh, unique uh, understandings on cognitive dissonance and I hope to continue my work together with her in uh, advancing her theories of cognitive dissonance. And then I went on to uh, look at cognitive dissonance, some of the Festinger and the history of the development of the ideas, um, the relationship to evolution and how cognitive dissonance fits in evolution and emotion or even problems between cognitive dissonance and evolution. And then the relationship between uh, music and cognitive dissonance and emotion, very interesting. And then uh, you know, after that, uh, more about uh, emotion and cognitive dissonance. So there's you know, obviously some level of dissonance purely on the cognitive level of uh, just trying to uh, um, sense perception or uh, thinking, let alone the emotional uh, attachment to it. But usually people think of cognitive dissonance, they think of uh, emotional process. And then I had a paper that went over uh, the neurological understanding and tests of cognitive dissonance, which part of the brains are active and uh, um, what the neurological tests on cognitive dissonance uh, seem to be promoting. And then uh, probably one of the dominant theories today if for a cognitive neuroscience of, uh, neuroscience of cognitive dissonance is this uh, um, action-based model of dissonance where, where it's saying that it's, it's not just the thoughts in our head in the conflict with emotion, but it's a holistic connection between action, um, emotion, and thought, and uh, dissonance works to be action-oriented. The pers purpose of dissonance is to facilitate uh, action in the material realm, which uh, l largely makes sense, and it would work with that idea, but I wanted to cover that, and, uh, you know, then fitting in with, uh, you know, modern evolutionary models, uh, you know, the dissonance theory versus Duvid, uh, is generally going to have an alternative explanation of dissonance that is not evolutionary. Um, but, you know, so I want to fit this in with the mainstream science of the time of, you know, so say the Western canon that controls the university and publication system, at least where I am. And, uh, but uh, the purpose of the multiple truth hypothesis will eventually give this global difference. And you said action based model talked about cultural differences. And there could be multiple different cultural factors that cause people to reduce dissonance in different ways. And, uh, and possibly even uh, group dissonance reduction will be a different, uh, interesting thing to look into in the future. And just seeing how this relates to the multiple truth hypothesis is this, um, you'll say, how do we actually function? How do human beings take the huge amount of sensory input and uh, form sensory perception? How do we go about uh, decision making and, and controlling our actions and these various things? And uh, what I'm going to propose is going to be basically that this multiple truth hypothesis model is actually going to be uh, also an alternative model of cognitive dissonance. And, and we'll see later as I develop this more how this fits in with uh, Jennifer's model or the models I showed today, like the action based model or the various models mentioned in the paper. And then we'll compare the model that the brain, that the mind uses versus the computer uses. And I have a lot of stuff on chess 
I like to put uh, also in the study of chess. Uh, thanks, uh, Jim from Australia. Thanks for joining. So um, I have a lot of studies on how the brain forms thought from chess uh, versus the comparison of how the computer plays chess. And we'll look at uh, the multiple truth hypothesis uh, to say who is better at determining the truth of laws, reality, in the material realm, the human or the computer. Um, sorry, I can't understand the Russian, but thanks for joining also. I'm just about to wrap up my stream. So I, I've been at this for almost four hours. I read a lot of paperwork. Um, oh, you played with my chess cube. You know, King's Crusher. I, I, um, I haven't, I played a little crazy house recently. I haven't been playing much chess and like I chess coach, but because of uh, the COVID-19, the lockdown, I haven't been coaching much, but uh, well, well, blessings to my Serbian friend. Um, but uh, I coach chess and um, I use you know my understandings of cognitive development and how the brain uh, processes thought that you're related to chess. I have a series called Ramblings of a Chess Coach. I don't know when I'm going to go back to chess coaching, um, but you know I feel kind of vindicated as a chess coach in terms of uh, you know pedagogic method to test some of my theories on this. So uh, appreciate the people who tuned in. I hope people watch this. Uh, you know probably tomorrow I'll go through and timestamp in the description a table of contents. And I'm kind of excited about this. And maybe probably not tomorrow, probably next week, I'll re produce my second stream on uh, um, multiple truth hypothesis, which will cover more of the physics of the multiverse. And it might be a few streams. Those are pretty complicated. Um, just real quick, uh, Kabbalah and chess, I mean, capitalistically, you just say, what do the pieces represent? So from like a Indo-Iranian Vedic representation, the Kabbalist usually said the Baal Shem Tov gave an example of chess, possibly going back to uh, um, King Solomon, uh, but said that uh, um, the king, that, that basically chess is comparable to thought, action, and speech, which is uh, actually related to cognitive dissonance, the Kabbalistic model of the action-based model, you know, that cognitive dissonance is when there's a, uh, you know, equanimity of mind, body, and spirit. But in Kabbalistic terms, they use the expression um, thought, action, and speech. And then they'll give parallels to like the facilities of the soul and say like the king or the queen is action. The pieces, king, bishop, and rook is uh, spirit is a speech and then the pawns are thought and that could also correspond to like the queen the the wife um the pieces the servants and the pawns the children and so there's different cabalistic forms i, I talked about it with actually oki um from crazy house that there's also kind of say like let's say there's like platonic forms but there's configurations of karma so to say of uh, karmatic uh, patterns that occur through humanity and the patterns on the chessboard correspond to um, these uh, karmatic configurations of greater spirituality. So I, I do plan on connecting it. It's also, it's going to be related to dissonance theory and just how the mind performs thought. And also like, I like coaching chess and uh, plan on, uh, continue with that whenever you know, the COVID-19 lockdown is done. But I'm going to um, go out. I also might do some more chess streams. Like I, I was better at Crazy House. I was enjoying Crazy House uh, or Horde more than regular chess. It was a little bit more exciting. Um, but I, I didn't really have a, like a community to advance my ideas. And it seemed like kind of just like a waste of time playing a bunch of chess as opposed to advancing my ideas. If I, you know playing chess is in a form of advancing my ideas. So as of now, I'm, I'm not playing chess. I don't have any plans to play chess in the near future, but we'll see how that goes. It's likely that, uh, you know, I'll have to wait till uh, I start getting back into chess coaching to have uh, some sort of motivation to uh, play chess, you know, other than, although I will be um, producing a series of stream on uh, the thought processes related to chess without, you know, playing. So blessings, everybody about to, uh, 
sign up. I, I plan on doing Ask the Rabbi. So, Jim, if you want to join my Discord or anybody who wants to talk more, ask questions on Judaism, I plan on doing a bunch of Ask the Rabbi streams. Um, you know, so in the meantime, you could watch my previous videos or join my Discord if you want to question me directly. So with that, have a great night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. You know, thanks to Jennifer for coming on and supporting my research. And anybody who watches this, uh, you know, please uh, comment uh, uh, in the description and let's advance these ideas and try to create a better world for everybody. So God bless. Have a great night, everyone.